Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. This is the podcast where I'm reading all of the stuff in the dictionary, and there's a very silly TikTok video being recorded right now, and I really like this look. I might have to make that happen in real life. You can go to at Speedjampar to see the TikToky stuff. Okay, the first word is Kubrick. C U P R I C. Stanley Kubrick? Adjective from 1799. Of, relating to, or containing copper with a valence of two. And we're going to end this video here. Yep. All right. So, we don't want to see more videos on that. We're going to go back to the words. Hey, you know what? I forgot to say that uh, you got to go You gotta go do all the things. You got to rate this, and you got to review it, and share it, and subscribe it. All of those verbs. Can you think of other verbs that you can do with this podcast? Fly it. Um, And uh, if you want to follow this show on social media, Twitter and Instagram is at DictionaryPod. Email is DictionaryPod if you wanted to say something to me in any way. Oh my God, there's so many things. You can also join the Patreon for a few bucks a month and get episodes early. You can watch this on YouTube. You can write and perform and record a little song. If we, if you want to put a make a little intro ditty song, I'll put it at the beginning of the show if I like it. Haven't gotten any yet. Uh, you can record yourself doing a little sound effect, a short, you know, one to two seconds, real short, uh, maybe three or four seconds. We, you know, there's there's a little gray area there, uh, and then I'll use that in a show. And if you have opinions. On if you if there's a word in the future that you really like any word starting from the letter D forward, f- you know if you're listening to this after I've already posted those, then you you shouldn't you shouldn't tell me what you think of a word in the letter D. You know Darjeeling, you you've you've, you've you, this bad timing. It's very bad timing. Um, but if you're hitting this, if you're listening to this before I've hit the letter D. If you like a word from D all the way to the end of the episode, all the way to the end of the Z's, the alphabet, go ahead and record a little thing or send me an email. I'll put that in a show when we get to that word. I don't know how words work anymore. I think this is this show is breaking my brain. All right. We didn't even say a sound effect, so we're just going to go... All right. The second word in this episode is... Cupip... Uh, Cupriferous, cupriferous. It's uh, it's spelled like it sounds. Adjective from 1784, and it just means containing copper. Uh, because uh, if you look at the last word in yesterday's episode, it's the prefix cupre, which means copper, and the example was cupriferous. So it just anything that's cupriferous, which is hard to say, that contains copper. Wow, it sounds like I'm there's a baby here. Okay, the next word is cuprite or just cuprite. Noun from circa 1850. A red mineral consisting of copper oxide that is a minor ore of copper. Minor is very confusing because miners mine ore, but this is minor m i n o r, which means it's it's like a it's uh, not the major ore. It's the minor ore. It's in a minor key. Uh, yeah, obviously, this is using the same prefix. Just just means copper. <laughs> Next is cupronickel, or just cupronickel. And this was the example, again, in that same prefix definition for number two, which was copper and. So this one is copper and nickel. But we should probably read the actual definition. It's a noun from 1900, an alloy of copper and nickel, especially one containing about 70% copper and 30% nickel. Why is it that ratio? What do they use this for? Who cares? People care. There's a reason that this is made. It was the, is this uh, people made? Did the people make this or is it naturally occurring? Alloy just means it's uh, things combined together. 
maybe specifically metals. I don't know if you can have alloys of other materials, but this this is metal. Next is cuprous, or just cuprous. Again, I think this is going to be related to copper. Adjective from 1669 of relating to or containing copper with a valence of one. Just one valence. Next is cuprolate. Uh, There's no R. It's cupulate or cupulate. C-U-P-U-L-A-T-E. I see you. P-U. You're late. Adjective from 1835. Shaped like having or bearing a cupule. What is a cupule? I don't know. Let's say, and then we can read cupule. Noun from 1826. Uh, let's see, fourth, nine years before cupulate. So that makes sense. You get you, the cupule has to exist before something can be shaped like or having or bearing a cupule. So it is a cup-shaped anatomical structure. As a, and what is this word? Invol, invoc. It's going over to the second line. Involucra, involucra, Invo, or maybe it's pronounced involucre. What is this word? I'm just going to say an involucre. An involucre characteristic of the oak, in which the bracts are indurated and coherent. Wow, I know this clearly, it's very accurate, but how the hell is somebody supposed to understand that if you don't know plants and trees? And yeah, I mean, we, we're pretty much going to make this an adult podcast when I get to the D's because I want to say words. All right, and then B, so this is still adding on to the cup shaped anatomical structure. B, an outer Intugament, partially enclosing the seed of some seed ferns. Maybe we need to find pictures of what this is and how it's related to ferns and oaks and other stuff. Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting. And that this is from the Latin cupa, which means tub. And there's more at the word hive. Oh, so a hive. Yeah, that's sort of cup-shaped. A beehive. A beehive is maybe a cupule. (laughs) Next is cur or car. I think think cur sounds right. C-U-R, first form, noun from the 13th century. One, a mongrel or inferior dog. I don't think any dogs are inferior to any other dogs. That's just my opinion. All dogs are great. Uh, but, you know, I guess some are meaner. They've probably been raised that way. Don't do that. Don't, I don't like that. Number two, a surly or cowardly fellow. A cur. So this is from Middle English. It is short for cur dog, which is C-U-R-D-O-G-G-E, which is from the Middle English verb curren, which means to growl. Also, perhaps from the Old Norse, kura, C, uh, no, K-U-R-R-A, and that means to grumble. And then, of course, it's plus dog, which means dog. So a growling dog is a mongrel or inferior dog. (laughs) Next is the second form of cur. This is the abbreviation for one, currency, or two, current <laughs> next is curable curable adjective from the 14th century capable of being cured as in a curable illness i hope that one day all illnesses are curable because we definitely do not live in a world right now where illnesses are curable Curability is a noun, curableness is also a noun, and curably is an adverb. 
How would you use that word curably? Curably interesting. <laughs> Next is you can say curaso, curacao, or just curaso or curacao. And that's or you can emphasize the last syllable more so curaso, curacao. I always just say curacao. C U R A C A O and there is that little um, sort of C-shaped accent under the second C. Uh, oh, you can also spell it. You can you can repl- um, flip the O and the A at the end. Uh, so that would be Curasoa. Huh? Never knew about that one. Curasoa. So that little uh, accent under the C makes it a an S sound. Otherwise, it would look like Curacao or Curacoa, but it's Curacao or Curacoa. Noun from 1813. A liqueur flavored with the dried peel of the sour orange. So yeah, it's going to be like an orange flavored liqueur. It is Dutch. It's from Curacao. Uh, I guess that might be a town or a region in the Netherlands Netherlands Antilles. So, uh, yeah, they were like, hey, we got this sour orange. Let's dry the peel and put it in alcohol and see how it tastes. Oh, it's good. Let's make it. Next is curacy. C-U-R-A-C-Y. Curacy. Noun from 1682. The office or term of office of a curate. The office or the term of office of a curate, which is not next. I thought it was, but we're not there yet. (laughs) Next is curari. Yeah, curari. You can spell it two ways. C-U-R-A-R-E. Or instead of an E at the end, you can put an I. Curari. Noun from 1777. Just one long definition with some parentheses. Okay. A dried aqueous extract, especially of a vine, used by South American Indians to poison arrow tips and in medicine to produce muscular relaxation. I love this because this is a perfect example of the indigenous people who were living off the land, learned after generation after generation after generation, learned about the plants and all of their medicinal um, val- values. Is that what you Medicinal uh, purposes. And, uh, but also, it can, you can poison. If you use it in the wrong amounts, you can, it's also a poison. You got to be very careful. So, uh, this, it's, I love this. This is great. And uh, this, this is a thing that we've definitely gotten very far away from. And I think that there are certain people in certain places around the world who are slowly getting back to stuff like this because, because I think it makes sense. It's, it's there and it's, you can do it. And maybe it's there for a reason. I don't know. The vine that we're talking about. So it's extracted from this vine, which is uh, the scientific name is Strychnos. Toxifera. Yeah, I've heard of a, what is that? Strict, 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 nine something. Oh, I don't know. It's in my brain somewhere. But yeah, it must come from this or be related to this uh, chemically. That strictos toxifera is from the family Loganaceae. Um, also, there's another vine. I guess there's two of them. Chonodondendron. Or it could just be con condod wait condodendrum. There's an N at the end. There's so many consonants next to each other. Condodendron or chondon. That's probably a K sound. Condodendron. Tomes no. Tomentosum. <laughs> Why? Tomentosum. Yeah. Uh, that is of the family Menespermaceae. Close enough. I'm so sorry for all of this, people. Um, yeah, this is from Portuguese and Spanish curare, 
which is from Caribbean Kurari. It doesn't give me any more than that. Next is Curarize. Curarize. This is the transitive verb of curari from 1875, and it is to treat with curare or curari. Uh, yeah, curari. Curarization. That is a noun. Uh, next is curaso. So it's very, it's pronounced similar to um, the liqueur, but this is spelled very differently. It is C U R A S S O W. Curaso, yeah. Noun from 1685. Any of several large arboreal gallinaceous game birds of South and Central America. Maybe we should post a picture of these guys. Uh, they are of the family Crassidae, especially the genus Crax. So that that was Curaso, C-U-R-A-S-S-O-W. And this is actually just an alternative of Curaçao, which is the spelling of the liqueur. But that's in the Netherlands, and these birds are in South and Central America. So how did they did they did they like the liqueur and that's how they got the name? How is this connected to that word if it's a it's a Dutch word? That that's a fascinating translation there. I wonder what happened. Maybe they smell like orange, maybe they are orange. We'll learn about that later. <laughs> Next we have curate or curate. And this is the one where were we, where, where would, where did we have that? Uh, oh, uh, the curacy, that was the office or term of office of a curate or a curate. So either this form of curate or the next one will be related to that. So first form, noun, 14th century, one, a clergyman or clergyman in charge of a parish. Two. A clergyman serving as assistant in a parish. And assistant would be to a rector. R-E-C-T-O-R. This is from the Middle Latin curatus, or just curatus, curatus, which is from cura, which means cure of souls. Hmm. Cura is cure of souls. So the basically... Uh, they're a person who uh, gets to cure souls or deal with people's souls. Is that what I want in my life? I don't know about that. I want to have control of my own soul. Uh, it also means, uh, I guess the Latin cura also means care. I like that, care. Now we have the second form of curate. Emphasis on the first or second syllables, curate or curate. Transitive verb from 1909. To act as curator of. And the example is curate a museum. Also is in an exhibit curated by the museum's director. And that is definitely that uh, the Latin cura, which means care. They are taking care of the stuff in the museum. I mean, I guess you could also argue cure of souls is related to that somehow, too. Maybe there's, I don't know, you could figure it out on your own. All right, we have one more word for this episode. It is curate's egg. C-U-R-A-T-E, apostrophe S, and then the second word is E-G-G, the egg, it's the egg, it's the egg. Noun, from 1905. This is chiefly British, which is why I've never heard of it, and it is something with both good and bad parts or qualities. It is something that is both good and bad. Good and bad qualities, good and bad parts, Good and bad somethings. Okay, the etymology says it is from the story of a curate, or 
yeah, it would be a curate or curate, who was given a stale egg by his bishop. Okay, so this is the clergyman. He was given a stale egg by his bishop and declared that parts of it were excellent. All right, we got to find this story. We're going to put it in the show notes. Uh, parts of it. So it's, this egg is like, all right, trust me on this. This egg, it, it might seem stale. It smells, I get it. But there's aspects of it that are also very good. They're even excellent. How are you going to know? I'm not sure. You're going to have to just crack it open and find out. Am I right? Am I wrong? Let me know later. Or just don't. But this 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 egg, it's a curate's egg. It's your egg now. You're the curate. It's your egg. Have fun with it. Trust me. It's good and bad. How does this get used in everyday language in Britain? In England? In the UK? All over the place? All over that area? How do they use this? I want to know. Okay, so we had words today. They were cupric, cupriferous, cuprite, cupronickel, cuprous, cupulate, cupule, cur, cur, curable, curacao, curacy, curari, curize, no, curarize, curaso, curate, curate, or curate, and curate's egg. Let's see. We've got copper. We've got cups. Cup-shaped things. Dogs, abbreviations, things that cure liquor, uh, uh, clergy people or related to that. This vi- oh, that was pretty interesting. Uh, hmm. All right. Well, I think I'm going to pick curare as the word of the episode. C-U-R-A-R-E. And uh, yeah, because I just think it is so fascinating in the first place that plants around the world have these abilities. And But why? Why do they exist? I think that animals for all these millennia, millions of years, uh, they just learned somehow that they could... You know, I, I don't know. I just think it's fascinating. They probably consume these. I mean, I know that there are animals that will consume fermented fruit and get drunk. Uh, they probably also maybe get a little high from the cannabis plant, possibly. I'm not sure if that's even possible. Um, but yeah, they it just it happens. It happens more than I think we realize. So why not for something that's going to relax the muscles, either just the right amount or too much, they probably get affected by that too. And then humans got smart enough to actually like do something with that. And then we lost it. So let's bring it back. Let's bring back things like curare, but not in the poisonous way. Good short song. All right. This has been wonderful. Um, let's see. Let's see. We got, uh, supposedly there was a guest a couple of days ago. Haven't recorded that yet. I am very much looking forward to that. Uh, and there will be another guest coming up. Uh, let's see. The episode is airing on June June 18th. Um, I'm going to be recording that in just a few days. So that's going to be great too. All right. I think... I'm trying to think. Did we... Uh, watch this up? Yeah, I think that's good for today. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another just so stunning, amazing episode of this podcast called The Dictionary. I hope that you are enjoying it, and if you're new, (laughs) you're welcome. You're in for a ride, but go start at the beginning for the full ride. It's like a roller coaster. All right, the first word in this episode, top of page 306, it is curative, C U R A. T-I-V-E. Curative. Adjective from... That's an ad, curative is an adjective. From the 15th century. Relating to or used in the cure of diseases or also tending to cure. Curative. Curative is also a noun and curatively is an adverb. And uh, I don't think it means anything, but I do think it's kind of interesting that uh, the word in yesterday's episode, 
which I did pick as the word of the episode, curare, it's, uh, it will create essentially a disease because it's, it can be used as a poison. It, uh, it will make problems in your body, but it also has the word cure in there, which is the opposite of that. They're not related because it's different languages, Portuguese and Spanish, opposed to English, but, uh, you know, it is kind of interesting. All right. We need a sound effect, so we're just going to say, ba-boom. The next word is curator. Curator, cur- curator, you can emphasize that. That's good, curator. Noun from 1561, one who has the care and superintendence of something, especially one in charge of a museum, zoo, or other place of exhibit. Curatorial is an adjective. Curatorship is a noun. And uh, let's see, was there something? Let's see, the etymology. Yes, Latin verb curare, which means to care. We learned that yesterday. They care so much about the stuff in this uh, museum, zoo, or place of exhibit. If you're a curator and you want to talk about what it's like to be a curator, feel free to call the Google Voice number, leave a message, email me, DM me, whatever you want to do. Why not? Ba-boom. Next is the word curb. C-U-R-B. First form. Noun from the 15th century. One. A bit that exerts severe pressure on a horse's jaws. And then also, I don't like the sound of that, also, the chain or strap attached to it. And it says to see the bit illustration, which, uh, yeah, we did that a long time ago. So uh, I uh, severe pressure on the horse's jaws, I don't think that they like that. I don't like that. Can we redesign this to be a bit better? Number two, an enclosing frame, border, or edging is a curb. Three, synonyms are check and restraint, as in a price curb. Whoa, we gotta we gotta curb those prices, buddy. Four, a raised edge or margin to strengthen or confine. That could be so many different things. Number five, an edging, as of concrete, built along a street to form part of a gutter. And then, of course, that is very similar to the number four, which is a raised edge or margin to strengthen or confine. So a, a, the concrete curb is raised, and it, uh, it confines the cars to the street, uh, and it confines the grass to the parkway. <laughs> Um, the curb on my parents' street has always been extremely high, and I don't understand why. And then, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, they did some construction on the road, probably the pipes and stuff, and they were redoing the curb. Oh, great, they're going to lower the curb. Nope. They put it back at the same height. So when you, like, drop off somebody or, like, you're parked, you know, just fairly close to the curb... It always, like, the door gets stuck on the curb, and it's so irritating. I don't know why they don't fix it. Number six for curb. This one has its own etymology, but the definition says, a market for trading in securities not listed on a stock exchange. The etymology for this one says that it is from the fact that it is originally transacted its business on the street. It originally transacted its business on the street. Oh, the, the curb of the street. Uh, okay, so because these securities are not listed on the stock exchange, they couldn't be in the building where all the stock exchange stuff was happening. They had to go out on the street to, to, uh, to trade these securities. So that's why it became curb. They were sitting on the curb being like, hey, hey, dude, you want this security? I'll sell it to you. Yeah, dude, I want that security. I'll buy it from you. 
All right, is there any etymology for the whole thing? Yes, there is. It is from Middle French, courbe, which means curve, or curved piece of wood or iron. Uh, that's pretty much it. So yeah, a curb is curved. Ba-boom! Next is the second form of curb. Transitive verb from 1530. One, to furnish with a curb. All the different kinds of curbs. You're furnishing with it, you're curbing. Kirby. Two, to check or control with or as if with a curb. As in, trying to curb her curiosity. Why would you try to curb your curiosity? I feel like, why not? You got, why be, you got to be curious. You got to be curious. Three, to lead a dog to a suitable place as a gutter for defecation. <laughs> so without the parentheses, it just says, to lead to a suitable place for defecation. That's pooping, people. Um, and obviously the example is you're going to probably lead your dog to the gutter area or the curb area, but really, I mean, you're not, it's, you're, you're putting them by the grass, maybe back in the day, depending on the, uh, the city, how it was structured, maybe you were literally taking them to the gutter, so then their poop would go straight down into the sewer, which is where all of our poop goes, but we do it through a toilet system. Dogs don't do that. Most, most dogs don't, at least. Curb the dog. Um, a synonym for all is the word restrain. Ba-boom! Next is curb appeal. Two words, noun from 1975. I lost it. It is the visual attractiveness of a house as seen from the street. You have to stand on the curb to see how visually attractive or not a house is. Gotta have curb appeal. All the shows on HGTV, all those, they talk about curb appeal. You gotta, if it doesn't look good from the outside, you're not gonna wanna go inside and see it. Ba-boom! Next is curbing with an I-N-G. Noun from 1838. One, the material for a curb is the curbing. Two, this synonym is just curb. So I guess you can call just a curb a curbing, which, wow, this word sounds weird. Boom! Next is curb service. Two words, noun from a, uh, 1925. Cervix, service. Say the word correctly. Service extended to persons sitting in parked automobiles. Uh, and the place that would be doing this service would be a restaurant. Curb service. Well, there's, um, you know, there, there are those uh, sort of fast foodie places. They don't exist a whole lot anymore, but you see them in movies and TV shows where the, the people come out to your car and serve you. They take your order. They might be on roller skates. It's a thing that used to happen. Ba-boom. Next is Curbside, noun from 1946. One, the side of a pavement bordered by a curb. And then two, the synonym is sidewalk. A sidewalk is not a curb, but, you know, they might be right next to each other. Ba-boom. Next is curbstone. One word. Sounds like the last name of a cartoon character. Troy Curbstone, first form, noun from 1791, a stone or edging of concrete forming a curb. You could also call that curbing. It's not here in the book, but I'm saying it because a curbing is the material for a curb. So yeah, curbstone. Boom. Next is the second form of curbstone, adjective from 1848. One, operating on the street without maintaining an office. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things that my brain goes to. Like, are you per performing surgery? Are you operating on somebody on the street? No. 
Uh, you don't have an office, so you're you're doing your business on the street. No, it's not the dog defecating business. It's other business. As in, a curb stone broker. They would be uh, doing the curb, uh, the curb uh, securities, trading the securities on the curb. Two, for curb stone, not having the benefit of training or experience. As in, a curb stone critic. Why is that? Is it because uh, they they don't have the training or the experience, so they can't get inside the building? They can't do the critiquing or whatever their business is in the office, so they just have to do it from the street. Ba-boom! Next is curb weight. Two words, noun from 1949. The weight of an automobile with standard equipment and fuel, oil, and coolant. So, all the stuff, like, how much is a car going to weigh when it's just sitting on your curb, all fueled up, everything is good to go, solid, I don't know why I said solid, it's ready to go. Uh, What is the curb weight? How much does it weigh? Because if you, obviously, if you take out the fuel, it's going to weigh a little bit less. Yeah. Is it all filled up? Are there people inside of it? Are there, uh, is there, are there uh, things in the trunk? Probably not. We just want to know the car and the car stuff. How much does that weigh? Ba-boom. Next is Kirch. C-U-R-C-H. Noun from the 14th century. This one is Scottish, and it is the number one definition for the word kerchief. Kirch, yeah. They couldn't say if, kerchief. They just said kerch. It's a very small adjustment, but it is one syllable less. Boom. Next is curculio. Yeah, that's a fun word. Curculio. C U R C U L I O. Noun from 1756. Any of various weevils, especially one that injures fruit. Okay, I am, I am confused and fascinated. So weevils, I, those are just little animals, aren't they? Aren't they? Bull weevils? I think we had that before. Um, and they injure fruit. How do they injure fruit? Can you injure fruit? Does fruit get injured? This, this is, this is boggling to me. Uh, yeah. So this is a Latin word, uh, cur- curculio. And it just means grain weevil. So the grain weevils are getting all up in the grain and the fruit. Maybe they're fruit ninjas. Boom! Next is curcumin. Curcumin. C U R. And then the word cumin, which I think this is, this might be related to, sort of related to cumin. Um, it is a noun from 1850 it is an orange yellow crystalline compound c21 h20 o6 that constitutes the chief coloring principle of turmeric and i'm looking at the etymology let's see it is from the new latin curcuma which is the turmeric plant um from the arabic curcum and, uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't specifically say it's related to cumin, but I feel like cumin and turmeric are similar colors. But anyway, it's more about turmeric. Ba-boom. Next is curd, C-U-R-D. First form, noun from the 15th century, one. The thick, casein-rich part of coagulated milk. And that makes me want to barf. Two, something suggesting the curd of milk. Curdy is an adjective. But people eat this. They like it. Uh, there's, I know there's cheese curds that you can get. That's all related. It's all dairy being coagulated and stuff. This is from, let's see, the Old English crudon which means to press, so maybe it's been, yeah, the coagulated milk is pressed together to make this solid 
curd thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Ba-boom. Next is the second form of curd verb from the 15th century. The synonyms are coagulate and curdle. Go ahead and curd that milk, baby. Okay, next is related. Ba-boom. It is curdle. Verb from the 1590, starting with intransitive. One, to form curds. Also, to congeal. To congeal as if by forming curds. As in, a scream curdled in her throat. So it just, it got stuck there. She couldn't let it out. She was so scared. Her her scream got stuck in her throat. Let it out. Two, to go bad or wrong. Synonym is spoil. Now we've got transitive. One, to cause curds to form in, as in curdled milk. You might want to toss it. Two, the synonyms are spoil and sour. Uh, That's it for that one. We've got one more word for this episode. Boom. Bah. It is the first form of cure. C-U-R-E. It is a noun from the 14th century. One. One A. Spiritual charge. And the synonym is care. Spiritual charge. I don't even know what that means. One B. Pastoral charge of a parish. And that is going to be related to the word yesterday, the curate, the clergy person in a parish. Uh, To A, recovery or relief from a disease. If you got a disease, you want to be cured of it. You need that relief or the recovery. It feels so good. To B, something as a drug or treatment that cures a disease. So the the uh, the thing, there's the thing that could cure a disease, that is cure. But then just the whole the whole act of getting rid of the disease is a cure. I could think. 2C. A course or period of treatment, as in take the cure for alcoholism. Uh, what what would that course or period of treatment be? 2D, it is the number one definition for the word spa. And yeah, I feel like that would cure my ailments. Just go sit in a, sit in a spa, sit in a, what do they call that? The steam, the steam room. Um, Number three, a complete or permanent solution or remedy, as in seeking a cure for unemployment. Is there a cure? For unemployment? Just for everybody? Number four, a process or method of curing. Cureless is an adjective. When it's uh, when we're talking about diseases, we do not want to be cureless. Although a lot of them are. Again, just uh, related to yesterday, a couple of words. We It's from the Middle Latin, cura, which means cure of souls. And then again, also the Latin word, uh, was well, it is Latin, cura, and it means care. You got to take care of the people so they can be cured. So the words in this episode were curative, curator, curb, curb, curb appeal, curbing, curb service, curbside, curbstone, curbstone, curb weight, kerch, curculio, curcumin, no, curcumin, curd, curd, curdle, and cure. Uh, let's see. I think I'm looking ahead. Okay. I think uh, I might just pick cure as the word of the episode. Mm, there wasn't anything really jumping out at me. I mean, you know, curbs, they're so good when your car door gets stuck on them. Uh but, 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 but yeah, let's just pick cure as the word of the episode because we want cures for diseases. Let's find all the cures for diseases. They must be out there. Go find them. 
Okay, that is going to be the end of this episode. We are so close to the end of the seas. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned this. I know I'll mention it again. I haven't made a decision officially, but what I think I might do is after the seas, I think I might give myself a break. Uh, I was just going to go straight into the D's, but I think it would probably be good for my mental health and physical health to just take, a. I think, maybe a month. Will you be able to handle a month away from this? I hope you can. You can just go back to listen to the old episodes. Again, no decisions have been made, but I think it would be good for me to take a short little break, and maybe I will do that after each letter, um, because, you know, this is a lot. This is a lot to do regularly um that's probably what's going to happen and you know this whole podcast might take a little bit of a different form when we get to the d's of as i mentioned there might be some uh, language that the younger kids don't want to hear or maybe the adults don't want their younger kids to hear so figure out what you want to do with that i say let the kids listen to it that's my opinion all right we're gonna end this now now this has been spencer dispensing information now Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Yay. Oh, yeah, we're going to have some fun. Uh, Okay, so the first word in this episode is cure. This is the second form because we had the first form in yesterday's episode. And it's been a very, very, very long time since I recorded that episode because of reasons. And uh, so I don't even remember what happened in yesterday's episode. But, you know, that's fine. Okay. Cure, verb, from the 14th century, starting with transitive. 1A, to restore to health, soundness, or normality. Health, soundness, if you're not sound, if you're not, you know, all together, if you're not healthy, or you're not normal, I'm going to put quotes around that one, Uh, And then you get restored. All those get restored back to health, soundness, and normality. You are being cured. 1B, to bring about recovery from, as in, cure a disease. I hope, I hope, I hope we get more of that. Science, technology, medicine, let's bring it. We need to cure some diseases. I think... My personal thoughts on that, just real quick, uh, I think there's a lot of things that uh, can be uh, minimized or possibly cured by diet and exercise, and I think that we should all uh, try that first. Obviously, talk to your doctor, but I do think that a lot of things get prescribed from doctors that are maybe not necessarily needed or uh, maybe not in certain doses or right away. I think we gotta, you got to try a lot of other things first, specifically People are real bad about diet and exercise. So start there, eat a good, healthy diet, get your body going. Ooh, yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to 2A. To deal with in a way that eliminates or rectifies. As in, uh, this quote, his small size, which time would cure for him. And that is from William Faulkner. Maybe I'll put in the show notes where that's from if I find out. Uh, to deal with in a way that eliminates or rectifies. So in this quote, are we saying, is is uh, Bill Faulkner t- saying that uh, his size will get cured? He will not be small anymore? Which time would cure for him? So yeah, this must be talking about a kid because I can't think of any example of where time will will cure somebody's small size. Yeah, they will grow. More than likely, they will grow into a larger size. Okay, to be, to free from something object objectionable or harmful. To free from something objectionable or harmful, as in, trying to cure him of a bad habit. Do you have a bad habit that you need to be cured of? You know, if it's not that bad, maybe you don't need to be cured of it. But, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't so great. Uh, people people biting their nails, that's a pretty common one. There's a lot of other bad, quote-unquote, bad habits that, uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes it just takes a little effort. I have I had a weird bad habit when I was a kid of 
not really chewing my nails, but more the skin on the sides. And, you know, I, after a while, I was just like, all right, you got to stop, dude. Just stop it. And so uh, I was, I pretty much stopped. It's still a little bit of a, a weird little thing, but uh, I, I'm mostly cured of that bad habit. Three, to prepare or alter, especially by chemical or physical processing for keeping or use, as in fish cured with salt. I always, always wondered about this one. This is weird. Let's read it again. To prepare or alter, especially by chemical or physical processing for keeping or use. So you're, uh, you're preparing a thing by, with either physical ways or chemical ways. I mean, those are kind of similar, but yeah. Physical or chemical ways to, to keep it uh, for longer use. I think that's a pretty good general description of that. Although I don't think I said it very well. Okay, let's move on to intransitive 1A, to undergo a curing process. That could be curing a disease, curing your body, or even this whole fish curing thing. Number 1B is the number 11 definition for the word set. Set it and forget it. Number 2, to affect I I need to be more specific. To effect a cure. To effect a cure. Cure Curer is a noun. The one who's making all the curing happening. Okay, uh, let's see. My sound effect will be... Huh. Hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next is cure or cure. You can emphasize either syllable. I think I will say cure. It's uh, spelled like cure, but there's an accent on the E. Whoop. Noun from 1655, and it is just a parish priest. Uh, let's see, from Middle Latin, curatus, and there's more at the word curate. So yeah, I kind of remember when we had that word. Actually, was that uh, just a couple a couple episodes ago? Yeah, uh, clergyman in charge of a parish. Yep, they are the cure. Puree the cure. Next. Hmm. <laughs> we have cure all. Two words with a hyphen. Cure and all. Like the laundry detergent that I don't even know if it exists anymore. Noun from 1801. A remedy for all ills. All ills will be remedied by this cure all. The synonym is panacea, P-A-N-A-C-E-A. I don't think this exists. It is a phrase that people have liked to use. Oh, it's a cure-all. Step right up, buy this stuff. It's a, it's, I'm selling a snake oil that will cure all everything. No, I'm sorry. I don't think that exists. But, you know, good for you for making a buck. If you, if you find out about something that it claims to be a cure-all... Maybe do some research. It's probably not real. Sim- similar to like superfoods and all that kind of stuff. It's uh, it's probably probably not as good as you think it is. But you know, a lot of them are still good to have. You know, acai is that a thing? Avocados. They're all they're healthy, but they're not gonna cure everything. They're not a cure all. You need to uh, like I said before, you need to have a well-rounded good diet. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Next we have curatage. Curatage. C U R E T T A G E. Noun from 1897. A surgical scraping or cleaning by means of a curette. Well, that doesn't sound fun. I hope that you are have been put out completely. You're asleep during this whole surgical process because there's scraping and cleaning done by a curette, which, wouldn't you know it, it's our next word. Huh? Huh. Curette, first form. You can spell it with a T-T-E at the end, or just a T. Noun from 1753. A surgical instrument that has a scoop, a ring, or loop, at the tip, and is used in performing curatage. 
you're, you're doing curettage with a curette. So this thing, depending on what is needed in this surgery, it either has a scoop at the end, which the, the mind can only wonder what that would be used for. I have heard of people doing some ridiculous uh, surgical procedures back in the day. And yes, some of it required scoops. Um, it also could have a ring or a loop. Maybe we should find a picture of a curette and post it on social media. Okay, so, you know, back in the 1753s, yeah, they, 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 knew, they knew something about surgery, but not nearly as much as we do now. I mean, that was 250 years ago, more. So we've learned a lot. People maybe, maybe weren't doing uh, the right things, uh, especially like with mental illness. There was a whole thing about they thought you could drill holes in the head or scoop out these things or um, in that show, Ratchet. Uh, you know, this is real. They would poke people by the eyeball into the brain to do uh, frontal lobotomies and all this crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, you know, we learned. People people died in the meantime, but we learned a lot. So that is all to say that uh, using that, that, that tool is called a curette, and it is called a curette because it is from the... Uh, it basically means to cure. It's from the French curer, which means to cure. So they thought, and maybe sometimes it worked, but they thought that using this curette and doing a curettage would cure you of your ailments, whatever ailments they were scooping out. Should we move on to the next one? Huh. <laughs> it is the second form of curette. This is the verb, transitive verb, from 1888, to perform curettage on. So you got a curette, you're doing curettage, and so you are curetting. Curetment, that is a noun. Hmm. Hmm. Next is curfew. Noun from the 14th century. Maybe if you're a child or a young adult, you may have been given a curfew for some reason. What What is it? What is it? I don't know. Yes, I do know. But let's find out, because there's multiple definitions. One, the sounding of a bell at evening. So if, like, a town has a curfew, maybe they will sound a little bell, and that sound is the curfew bell, or just the curfew. Two, a, a regulation enjoining the withdrawal of usually specified persons from the streets or the closing of business establishments or places of assembly at a stated hour. Uh, and examples of these specified persons would be juveniles or military personnel. So it is what? A regulation enjoining the withdrawal. Wow, it's so, it's worded so weird. So weird. Basically, it's like, hey, you people, juveniles or military people or other people, uh, get off the streets, close your businesses uh, at, at the stated hour. Curfew. 2B. A signal to announce the beginning of a curfew. So it's similar to that number one. It's just the bell, the sounding of the bell at evening. But in more specifically, the beginning of curfew and then how long do they give you? Do they give you like, is there like a 15 minute grace period, a half hour grace period? When does curfew end? I mean, I guess the end of curfew would maybe be the morning. Maybe, is there a bell for that? Is it like a, like a 10 hour period maybe? Two, let's see, to see the hour at which a curfew becomes effective. So if curfew starts at 7 p.m., 7 p.m. is the curfew. 2. D. The period during which a curfew is in effect. So I feel like this could be, you know, it could be 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Usually it's at nighttime. It would be, I, I don't know, I don't know an example of a place that would have curfew during the day, but it might happen. So yeah, maybe 7 to 7, uh, that is the curfew time. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Next is curia, or just curia, C-U-R-I-A. 
noun from 1600, 1a, a division of the ancient Roman people comprising several gents or gentes of a tribe. Gentes is G-E-N-T-E-S. Don't know how to say it. A division of the ancient Roman people comprising several gen. So I, th- I think that's several people of a tribe. So it's a, a portion of the ancient Roman people that uh, that has m- several people in a tribe. It's the Curia. 1B. The place of assembly of one of these divisions. So the, the ancient Roman people are divided up into Curia, and then where they meet, where they assemble, is also called Curia. 2A. The court of a medieval king. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Oh, I'm, I'm just remembering now, I did not do the etymology for curfew, which is incredibly important. So, sorry to uh, stop with the Curia talk, but we got to backtrack real quick. Cur- curfew is from Anglo-French, couvre-feu. That is uh, a signal given to bank the hearth fire. A signal given to bank the, the hearth fire. So I think that's like, we got a fire going, but we got we to gotta close it up. This, this is our signal to say time to close up the hearth fire. Uh, it also just means curfew. So, okay, this is where the word comes from. It is from the verb coverir, which means to cover, and then few, spelled a couple ways, which means fire. So it literally means cover up your fire because, you know, you had the fire to light your house and warm your house, but it's time for bed. No more lights. Go to go to bed. Go to bed. Cover your fire. It became uh, co- coverfew. I don't know how the Anglo-French said that. And then curfew. This is This is great. Uh, and then it, it comes also down to uh, Latin focus, the word uh, the word for fire. Anglo French few goes to the Latin focus, which means hearth, which would be probably the focus of a household back in those days. So that's kind of interesting. So yeah, I love that etymology. I'm glad I went back to read it. Okay, back to curia. I think we're on 2B. It is a court of justice. So 2A was the court of a medieval king, and 2B is a court of justice. Similar, little different. Number three is often capitalized. This is the body of congregations, tribunals, and offices through which the Pope governs the Roman Catholic Church. (laughs) That was on the next line, and I didn't know it was there. The Roman Catholic Church church. Curial, with an L at the end, is an adjective. I'm not going to skip the etymology this time, so it is Latin, perhaps from co plus weir, which is spelled V-I-R. It looks like veer, but they would have pronounced it weir, and that means man. So, man? I mean, you know, we, we can sort of assume that just means people. So that makes sense for the first one. It's a division of the old, the ancient Roman people. And uh, I don't know why the, where the co-prefix, what that means exactly here. But yeah, co, vir, or weir. Uh, there's more at the word virile. V-I-R-I-L-E. Okay, next. Hmm, hmm, hmm. We have curie or curie. Emphasize either syllable. It is a noun from 1910. I think I will say curie. Yeah, emphasis on the first one. That's how I like it. Number one, a unit quantity of any radioactive nuclide in which 3.7 times 10 to the 10th power disintegrations occur per second. That is a lot of disintegrations. So, a unit quantity of any radioactive nuclide. So, I don't know what a nuclide is, but it's something nuclear. And when there's 3.7 times 10 to the 10th power, so that would be 
I believe, let's see. Well, I, hey, I've got my I've got my computer here with a with a calculator. I also have my phone with a calculator. Let's see. 3.7. No, wait, let's start over. Let's do 10. You know what? This is dumb. Uh, so instead, I'm just going to say, I think 10 to the 10th power is a one with 10 zeros behind it. And then you add that to the 3.7 and you got, you know, three, seven, and then nine zeros, I think. So it's a, it's like, I don't know. What is that? 3.7 trillion disintegrations. It's a lot. It's, I think it's at least a billion or a trillion somethings. Number two, a unit of radioactivity equal to, again, 3.7 times 10 to the 10th power disintegrations per second. And now I'm tempted to use this slightly fancier uh, thingamajigger. 10 to the 10 is that times 3.7 is, okay, so yes, 37, I think that would be billion, 37 billion disintegrations. Hey, if I did my math wrong, please let me know. Email dictionarypod at gmail.com. This is from Marie and Pierre Curie. Are you shocked? I'm not shocked. Yeah, they dealt a lot with radioactivity stuff, and I think the the books that she worked with uh, still are radioactive to this day, and uh, so they got to keep them uh, all closed up. But uh, yeah, they, they were... they named a thing after them, which I think is pretty cool. What? Yeah, what? Next is Curie Point. Two words. The C in Curie is capitalized. Again, this is probably from Marie and Pierre Curie, although it's probably more Marie, I believe. Marie Curie. What a what a nice name. It's a beautiful name. Curie Point is a noun from 1911. One, the temperature at which there is a transition between the ferromagnetic and paramagnetic phases. I have no clue what those are. Ferromagnetic, I think, is, has to do with iron, and paramagnetic, no clue. But some when there goes from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic, those two phases, there's a... There's a tr- it's a transition point. There's a the temperature there is the Curie point. Maybe we need to post a, a link in the show notes because yeah, you you might want to learn more about it. Number two, a temperature at which the anomalies that characterize a ferroelectric substance disappear. I don't know what that means either, but it's still it's a it's a similar thing. It's another temperature, but something else is going on there at that temperature point. This is also called Curie temperature, which makes more sense to me, but I guess uh, the scientists, they like to use the word point probably more often. Otherwise, this would have said Curie temperature, and it would say called also Curie point. All right, next. (sighs) We have Curio. Curio, noun from 1849, something as a decorative object, considered novel, rare, or bizarre. And the synonym is curiosity. Oh, that thing is so novel, rare, or bizarre. I'm going to call it a curiosity or just a curio. And then also just an unusual or bizarre person can be called a curio. I, th- I didn't know you could call a person that. I think that's cool. Um, yeah, this is this was more of a thing back in the day. You know, it's from 1849, so I think you know mid to late 1800s, early 1900s. That's probably when they were talking about curios. You don't really come across this word a whole lot anymore, I don't think. Uh, but I think I want some curios. Maybe we need to post a picture of some interesting curios. It sounds like Cheerios. Cheerios are not curios. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Next is curiosa. Oh, by the way, yeah, curio is just short for curiosity. So th- for some reason, they felt like they couldn't say the whole word 
Ooh, that's a curiosity. That takes too long to say. Ooh, that's a curio. Yep, that's the right length. Okay, curiosa. Noun from 1883. The synonyms are curiosities and rarities. So it's, yeah, they just, it's, it's the, the whole Latin thing of putting an A at the end, cure, uh, but it's not, it's not the plural of curio, but it is a way to pluralize a thing. Um, and then especially, there's more to the definition, it's, it usually is for unusual or erotic books are called curiosa. For some reason, I had a I had a brain fart. I was like, "Oh, that's the that's her name," uh, in uh, in the uh, you know in the the movie the that movie. No, her name was Furiosa, Mad Max. Uh, that was the movie. No, her name was Furiosa, but it is is close. I think that we're gonna actually end it there. Um, I was going to do one more, but I think I'm going to move it to the next episode because it makes a little bit of sense. I had hoped to have a guest on the next episode, but I have uh, I have reached out to four people and uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think, you know, I'm recording this just mere days before this airs. And uh, yeah, I don't I just don't think it's going to happen. I'll try again, but no promises. So it might just be me talking. But uh, but yes, that's that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so the words today were cure, cure, cure all, curatage, curette, curette, curfew, curia, curie, curie point, curio, and curiosa. These were all very nice words. Very wonderful. Um, let's see. I, I have a thought on which one I might want to pick. I do, I do really like curio. I think those things are really interesting. Novel, rare, bizarre. You know, you think of a shrunken head, a monkey paw, a whatever. Something weird, just something weird. I think those are great. Um, but I can post, I can post pictures of that, so that'll get a little extra love that way. I think I'm gonna pick curfew as the word of the episode just because I really enjoyed that etymology. It's cover your fire. That's what it means. Get, get a cover on the fire, go to sleep. Curfew. 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 I'm gonna cover my fire. Nah, I don't like that song. It's time for bed. It's the curfew. Get off the streets. Close your business. It's curfew. If you got a fire, put a cover on it. Hey, I think that's gonna be the end of this episode. Thank you very much. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. I am recording a little TikTok video with a very, very, very silly filter on it. <laughs> it makes me laugh a lot. Hey, I only have a few seconds on this thing, so let's just quickly say the first word. Maybe just the first number. The, the word is curiosity. C-U-R-I-O-S-I-T-Y. Noun from the 14th century, number one, desire to know. Ooh, we're going to stop this TikTok thing right here. Hey, it's very silly. Okay, click that button, click that button. Uh, you know, there's so much to say about curiosity. We're just going to click these real quick and hit the post and shut up, TikTok. In fact, phone, you go on airplane mode. Thank you very much. Okay, so... I hope you uh, have enjoyed that short little video that's on TikTok. This is going to be a great episode. I can really feel it in my bones. I hope you can too. So yeah, desire to know. That is curiosity. This word, you know, th there's a number of definitions and we might have some things to say about curiosity. Uh, first and foremost, I will say that yes, I did try to get the hosts of Curiosity Daily on this episode. Unfortunately, that was not able to happen. We did chat, and uh, and uh, yeah, it just didn't happen. No worries. Uh, I've reached out to a couple other people. By the way, if you haven't heard the podcast Curiosity Daily, you should go listen to it from the beginning. Uh, Ashley and Cody are awesome, so go listen to them talk about stuff. 
What else? Yes, I reached out to a couple other people because I think that they would have had a lot to say about this word curiosity, and uh, that didn't happen either. So I'm just flying solo. But if you have some opinions on the word curiosity, I don't know, maybe you don't feel as strongly about this word like I do, but uh, you can, you know, you can send, a, record one of those little voice memo things on your your telephony device and you can send it to me you can email it dictionarypod at gmail.com and you know there's other ways that you can get in contact with me which you all know all those things you can make your own video and you could post it on youtube and share it with me and then i can watch you ask me a question or say what you think about curiosity this is really kind of the reason why i'm i'm here i guess uh i guess i wouldn't have decided to record the myself reading the dictionary if I wasn't curious about stuff, either unconsciously or subconsciously. And uh, we, yeah, let's just read the definitions. Let's do that first. So we have 1A. So this is all under desire to know. What, what do we desire to know? Why do we desire to know? We don't know. Let's find out. 1A. Inquisitive interest in others' concerns. <laughs> This is not not what I was expecting right off the bat. The synonym is nosiness, but yeah, I mean for sure the nosy neighbor next door, they're gonna they're gonna be nosy and they very they're very curious about what's the what's the goings ons over there next door. Um, yeah, they maybe is their life just not interesting enough and they gotta know what's going on in other people's lives. Why are they nosy? But they provide for good comedy on our favorite sitcoms. One B. Interest leading to inquiry, as in intellectual curiosity. You have an interest in leading, and your interest leads. Okay, this is an interesting point to make. Your interest, you are interested in something, and that leads to you inquiring about it. You are asking about it. You are trying to learn about this thing that you're interested in. So the example is intellectual curiosity. Uh, then you are curious about being intellectual or just learning as many things as possible. Is that, is that what that means? If you know stuff, you're intellectual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. I guess, I guess this is the one that would fit with me. I don't know why you care to hear me say this, but, you know, I guess I feel like I, I got some stuff to say about this word because it's a good word. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a really important word in our world, because if you don't got it, then what's the why? I don't know. Yeah, so this one fits a lot with me. I just I'm interested in a lot of things, and I I want to learn about them, and I want to see what's 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 the world out there, and how is how does this audio recording thing work? How does this music thing work? What's how's this animation thing work? These are all the things that I'm interested. In. How is about this eating sweet, tasty donuts and stuff? Uh, yeah, so I'm just really curious about the world, and I just want to do all the stuff. Can't I just do all the stuff? Okay, number two, this is archaic, and it means undue nicety or fastidiousness. Oh my god, that is like one of the best words right there, fastidiousness. So it's archaic, so it's not really used in this way anymore. Undue nicety or fastidiousness. Undo nicety. Is that like you're you're too nice, you're not nice? You're putting the niceness in the wrong place? Fastidiousness, I kind of take that to mean like you're very sort of organized and put together. That's, I don't know, I could be wrong about that, but that's sort of how it makes sense in my brain. That's curious. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me because it's archaic and we don't use it that way anymore. 3A. One that arouses interest, especially for uncommon or exotic characteristics. One that arouses. This is a... Why? So, something that's different, that's unique, it might arouse some interest in us to, to go learn about it. Why? That's, why is that thing different than me? You know, not everybody thinks that, but that's sort of where this is going. It's for uncommon or exotic characteristics. So, yeah, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a... A, some sort of trait in the thing it could be anything, but it's just it's a curiosity, just like we had yesterday. Mm, curio, it's a curiosity. It's a it's a, b a bizarre, rare, novel. 
Why do we like those things so much? 3B. An unusual knickknack. And yeah, here's the synonym curio. Because yeah, I think curio is just short for curiosity, like we said yesterday. I actually did record that yesterday. And today, funnily enough, is the literally the very last episode I am recording for the seas because of the reasons I explained at the beginning. Uh, I just kept on pushing it back and pushing it back and pushing it back and pushing it back. And then I finished the last episode and I said, hey, I got to go back. <laughs> I can't forget about those because those are uh, those got to air in like five days. Okay. 3C is where we're at. A curious trait or aspect. A curious trait or aspect would be a curiosity. You, all of you, probably have some sort of curious trait in you. I think we all got it in us. I think you got it. So what is your curious trait? I don't know. I got I got a bunch of them, probably. I think, I think all of me is just one big curious trait. Okay, we need a sound effect. Uh, let's see. We'll, okay, we'll do... Uh, we won't think... We an idea just popped into our head. We're gonna go woo woo. That is gonna be the sound effect. Okay, next word is curious. You know, this one and the last one. These are good good words. Adjective from the 14th century. One a is archaic, and it means made carefully. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because it's archaic, I'm having to trouble. Trouble uh, making sense of that one. Something is made carefully. It's a. It's curious. That doesn't make sense to me. One B is obsolete, and the synonym is abstruse. Abstruse. I don't remember what that one was. No surprise there, but we must have read it. Okay, so we had one A was archaic. One B is obsolete. And now 1C is also archaic, back to archaic time. Precisely accurate is curious. Yeah, I would love to hear context of how people back in the day used these. That must have been like the 14th, 15th centuries. Number 2A, marked by desire to investigate and learn. Marked by desire to... Yeah, that's like what we had in Curious. uh, Interest leading to inquiry... And this one is uh, marked by desire to investigate and learn. You have a desire to go seek out some information and learn. If you, if you, what am I trying to say? You must have this if you are here in the first place. You were at the very least curious enough to see what, what is it when somebody reads the dictionary. But then also you're like, well, wait, it's the dictionary. And maybe there's some stuff I don't know. So I'm going to go, I, I, am, I have a desire to investigate and learn. We all need to do more of this. Okay, 2B, marked by inquisitive interest in others' concerns. And yep, that's that's connected to 1A and the last word, nosiness. All the nosies. That was that one. Uh, yeah, the synonym is nosy. Number three, exciting attention as strange, novel, or unexpected. And the synonym is odd. Odd. Yep. We've all got a little oddness in us, I think. Okay, exciting attention is strange. As in, a curious coincidence. That coincidence happened in such a curious fashion. Hmm. Why did it happen? I don't I don't know if there are actually con- coincidences. Did we talk about this before? I don't remember. I don't know. They happen a lot to me. And uh, it feels like it feels like uh, maybe, I don't know, is there a reason? Maybe it's not coincidences. Curiousness is a noun. Th- wouldn't you know it? We haven't seen some, some synonym information in a while, so let us read this. This should be good. Curious, inquisitive, and prying. There's only three. I wanted at least five. They mean interested in what is not one's personal or proper concern. Prying is interested in what is not one's person. Yeah, you're curious. You're prying into their their uh, their affairs. So that's that's what uh, all three of these mean. Curious, a neutral term, basically connotes an active desire to learn or to know. As in, children 
are curious about everything. Yes, they are. So are the cats. Curiosity killed the cat, you know. Yes, I know. Inquisitive suggests impertinent and habitual curiosity and persistent quizzing. Inquisitive. Yes, this is the one where you want to you really know the stuff. Impertinent, habitual curiosity, and persistent quizzing. Hmm. It is worded kind of funny, though. As in, dreaded the visits of their inquisitive relatives. Okay, maybe I was wrong about that. They're inquisitive. They just, they're just, they're asking a lot of questions, right? Yeah. Prying. This implies busy meddling and officiousness. Prying implies busy meddling. Yeah, you're in the, this is the one where you're in the people's affairs. Just real a lot more than the other ones. Prying neighbors who refuse to mind their own business. Get off my lawn. No, we, we, we should all, we should all hang out and, be, be good neighbors. Okay, sound effect time. Woo whoop. Curiously is next, adverb from the 14th century. One, in a curious manner, as in, seemed curiously calm. Hmm, that's not supposed to be like that. That's happening in a curious manner. Two, as is curious, as in, Curiously, he continues to win re-election. Well, why would he win re-election? If it's, if it's curious, maybe, maybe he shouldn't be winning. Why? Why does this keep on happening? Wee, wee, wee. Next is curium. Noun from 1946. A metallic radioactive element produced artificially. And it says to see the element table. So we will get there. Oh, we're going to learn about all the whole periodic table in a f- two to three years. I can't wait. So this is from Marie and Pierre Pierre Curie. Curium. And then yesterday we had Curie, the Curie point, and the, all that disintegrations and the temperatures and stuff. Uh, so yeah, they, uh, they, got a whole, they got a whole radioactive element named after them. They probably made it. They were like, what, what, how many more, what is it? Protons can we put in there and electrons? Let's try and cram them all together. Is that how, how do you do that? How do you do that? Wee, 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 wee. Next is curl. Verb from the 14th century. First is in, uh, it's just, it's transitive. It's transitive. Okay, listen, it's transitive. Number one, to form into coils or ringlets. And yeah, we're, we're probably talking about hair here. You put your hair in curls, it coils. They're like little ringlets like, uh, you know, what's-her-face, Goldilocks probably had ringlets. Number two, to form into a curved shape. And the synonym is twist. Like, uh, hmm, what, what are you twisting I can't think of something that you'd twist that you'd say, oh, I curled it, because you twisted it. As in, the example, maybe this will help. Curled his lip in a sneer. I would not say that I'm twisting my lip in a, in a uh, what a sneer. Curl makes sense, not twist. Number three, to finish, no, 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 to furnish with curls. You're furnishing curls. You're putting curls on a couch, now we have intransitive, 1A, to grow in coils or spirals. Like a, like a, there's vines and things, and was it maybe cucumber or pea, the pea plants? Did they have like vines that curled around? I'm trying to remember from my childhood when we actually had a little garden. Okay, number three, the action of curling and also the wood. So when you're curling the wood, when you're is that when you're sh- you're doing the plane thing across? Uh, you make little curls. The action of curl, yeah, it must be maybe I don't know. Number four, a curved or spiral marking in the grain of wood. It's a curl. That's where the knot is, right? I think so. A curved or spiral marking. Hmm. Number five, 
a hollow arch of water formed when the crest of a breaking wave spills forward. Do you enjoy listening to me think? Can you, can you hear the gears turning in my head? I'm sure it's incredibly riveting. So a hollow arch of water formed. So yeah, when the waves are coming at you and they break and just that little, just the top little curl part, the arch of the water is called a curl. Wait, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't surfboard. So I don't, I'm not big on the lingo. I don't know all the lingo things that they say. And even if I tried, it wouldn't come out so good. And it, it would just be, you just want to laugh at it. So uh, check out those curls, dude. Is that what they say? I don't know. Number six. A usually short pass pattern in football in which a receiver runs downfield and then curves back toward the line of scrimmage. And they just, they made a little curl. What do you say? Like curl, curl 10 yards, curl 20 yards. What do they say when they're in that little huddle? I've never been in one. Number seven, a bodybuilding exercise in which a weight held with the palms facing up is raised and lowered by flexing only the wrists or elbows. If I had video, I could show you. You do the curls. You got to be careful though, right? I think a lot of people have bad form and they start they start swinging the top part from the shoulder to the elbow, but you really got to keep that. I feel like you got to keep it pretty well locked, don't you? So uh, just just keep the from the elbow down. That's that's where you're hinging at the elbow. Do a proper curl, people. Where were we? Uh, to furnish, to grow coils, to form rips, da, da, da. Did we skip a whole thing or something? To grow in coils or so. To form ripples or crinkles. No, we didn't even get there. I think we just, uh, wow. Okay, we're going to have to pause for a second. Where are we? Okay, so I figured it out. Somehow, after I finished the definition in uh, the, the, the verb form of curl, I skipped over to the noun form of curl, which is the next one. And that is just not how you do things. So, we talked about the peas in the garden, and uh, 1B for intransitive, to form ripples or crinkles, as in bacon curling in a pan. When I used to eat that stuff, that was like, that was just an amazing thing to be cooking up some bacon. I loved it. I'm done. No more bacon for me. I've had one good vegan bacon and all you other people better work hard to get to this level. The Butcher's Son in Berkeley. They have the best vegan bacon I have ever had, hands down. Number two, to move or progress in curves or spirals, as in the synonym wind, as in the example, the path curled along the mountainside. Just curling along the mountainside. Just just along the edges. Number three, the synonyms are twist and contort. Number four, to play the game of curling. Yeah, we're going to talk about that later. And this is going to be an extremely long episode because I just have things to say. But hey, whatever. So the noun form of curl, we did that one. I'm just trying to find where we left off. Action of curling. I think we did them all, actually. Yep, we did. So it's sound effect time. Uh, after I look at these uh, this etymology, you know what? <laughs> the etymology for curl, it just means curly in, you know, Old High German and Middle English. Curl means curly. That's where it, That's just what it means, I guess. I think we didn't have, oh, curious, uh, the etymology there, because I skipped that was the Latin curiosus, which means careful or inquisitive. And then also from the cura, which means cure. So do you, that's kind of an interesting etymology there, an evolution of etymology. You know, if it's the way that I'm sort of thinking, if you, you, you think you're going to get cured in life if you are curious and you go learn about the world, or which sort of version of curious are we talking about? Somebody who's nosy? Hmm. Seeing cure in there is interesting. So, sound effect. Woo, 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 woo. I'm not. It's hard to keep track. I don't know if I keep on adding one. I don't think I'll keep up with that. Curler is next. Noun from 1638. One, a player of curling. 
is a curler because they're making a thing curl? Why is it called that? We'll learn soon. Two, one that curls, especially a device on which hair is wound for curling. Lots of people like to use these things and spend a good chunk of time in the bathroom. Curling the hair, no judgment. It looks very nice either way. Luckily, I have naturally curly hair if I let it out. So if I, if I wanted to curl my hair, I'd be like, no, dude, it's already curly. I feel like somebody told me to get a, uh, what is that thing called? A perm? No, I'm never get, getting a perm. Somebody said that. Woo, 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 woo. Next is curlew. Curlew. Noun from the 14th century. Any of various largely brownish, chiefly migratory birds having long legs and a long, slender, down-curved bill and related to the sandpipers and the snipes. How did they get the name snipes? Sandpipers maybe makes a little more sense, but they literally took out the A, the D, the P, and the R. They took those letters out of sandpipers, and it just became snipes. So is, is there a connection there, or am I just seeing it? So the genus name is Numenius. So long, long legs and a down-curved bill. A curly. I've never heard of this one. Woo, 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 woo. Next is curly Q. You can spell it C U R L I C U E, or instead of the I, you can put in a Y. Noun from 1843 a fancifully curved or spiral figure. And a synonym is flourish. I have to say that word like that every time. A flourish. That just sounds like it, how you've got to say it. Curly Q. It's just, yeah, a little, you know, a little thing just on a thing. A decorative curly Q. The word looks very weird. I never really thought about how you spelled curly Q. So when I first read it, I was like, what, what is this word? Woo, 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 woo. Next is the second form of curly Q. This is a verb from 1844. Intransitive is to form curly cues. This, you got the, the ribbon, you got the scissors, and you run the thing down, and it makes a curly cue. But is it something you got to be on the right side? Have people said you got to be on this side, not this side? Uh, I feel like I heard that once. Yours, I don't think it really matters. Transitive to embellish with curly cues. Maybe a, maybe it's like a dresser. You want some fancy curly cues on there. Okay, we are now on this one. Woo 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 woo. Curling. Noun from 1620. A game in which two teams of four players each slide curling stones over a stone. A stretch of ice toward a target circle. We love to make fun of this, but I think it's probably pretty hard to be good at it. I think it would be fun to try it someday. I've done, uh, you know, the shuffleboard. Did the shuffleboard with the little metal thing on the table. It's like mini shuffleboard in the sand. It's, it, it's, uh, it's not easy. And people, people are good at that stuff. It's a very slow nice nice game just a lot of you, you're chatting probably there's probably a lot of talk about how are we going to do this what's the strategy here okay i'll i'll push it at this speed i'm going to try and hit this speed i'm going to start over here i'm going to try and angle it over here and then you guys you just brush real hard brush real hard brush real hard brush real hard and then and then we'll win okay i think we did that so woo 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 I'm trying to keep count. I don't know if I'm right, but I'm trying. I said I wouldn't, but I am. I can't help it. Curling iron is next. Noun from 1616. A rod-shaped, usually metal instrument, which is heated and around which a lock of hair to be curled or waved is wound. We definitely have at least one of these in our house. Probably more, but I don't know. I, I think every everybody's got 
one of these in their house. Most people. Okay. I hope somebody is going back and keeping track for me. Curling stone is next. Curling iron and curling stone. Iron and stone. One of them, you know, they're different, but they're they're kind of the same, right? They're like, yeah. Noun from 1620. And ellipsoid stone or occasionally a piece of iron with a gooseneck handle used in the game of curling. Okay, wait. So it's ellipsoid stone. I knew that. But does it say, is it saying that occasionally it's a piece of iron? Hmm, then that would be a curling iron. Get it? Good. It's got the gooseneck handle, so you got a good place to hold it. There's a picture of a curling stone. It's a, it's a big oval with a flat bottom and a flat top, just like me. And uh, there's these, like, sort of ribs around it, and the handle is on the top. Um, these things are very, very heavy. I don't know if people know this. When you think about a curling stone, do you think it's going to be light or heavy? It's very, very heavy for such a small stone. I mean, it is called a stone, so that's pretty obvious. But, you know, I didn't. I just didn't expect it to be so heavy. Somebody had one at their house, so I got to pick it up. That was kind of cool. Hey, there's one more for this episode. We have curl paper. One word, noun from circa 1817. A strip of or piece of paper around which a lock of hair is wound for curling. Curl paper, a strip of piece of paper. You put the paper in the, you put the hair in the paper? Strip or piece of paper around which, I have not heard of this. Just paper? How does that work? Hmm, that's interesting. All right, so the words in this episode were curiosity, curious, curiously, curium, curl, curl, curler, Curlew, curly Q, curly Q, curling, curling iron, curling stone, curly sue, and curl paper. I think I'm going to have to pick either curiosity or curious. I mean, you know, this is, this, this, you know, it's a very similar thing. Curious, I'm curious about stuff. I have curiosity. I don't know. I'm kind of leaning towards curiosity. It's like I said before, it's just, uh, it's good to be curious. If you, I think it's very good because it allows you to sort of, sort of change your life. Otherwise, I think you just get stagnant. That's how I feel. And uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's just like you got to keep, because you know what? Life's going to change on you no matter what. It's just going to happen. You can't control it. There's just going to be stuff that happens that's not, that you're unexpecting. You're not expecting. It's unexpected. So, uh, yeah, go go make the change happen, is what I say. Be the change you want to see in the world. Curiosity, yeah, yeah. That's all the song needs to be. This is going to be the end of the episode. This is also going to be, it's not going to be as meaningful for you as it is for me. But this is the last episode to be recorded for the seas. And then you still have uh, like 25 days until you get to the actual episode, uh, last episode of the seas. Yeah, I think that's it. Next up, it's the D train. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Please go rate and review this podcast. I think that would be great. It's called The Dictionary. You can go find that. This is the last section of page 306. The first word is curl up. It is an intransitive verb from 1840 to arrange oneself in or as if in a ball or curl, as in curl up by the fire, also as in curl up with a good book. Oh, that sounds just wonderful to me right now. Um, you know, I'm just going to post this little thing onto the tiki takis and we're just going to hit the button and done. Ugh, so much sound. Oh, right. Um, 
Tiki Taki. That's a good sound effect for this episode. The next word is curly. My hair was getting pretty curly because it was getting pretty long, and then I just got it cut yesterday. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not so curly right now. This is an adjective from 1598. One, tending to curl. Also, having curls, as in curly hair. Maybe if I find a good picture, I'll post a picture of me with my longer curly hair. It's very large curls, uh, but, you know, to get to that length where it will actually curl like that, it takes a, a lot of patience, and it looks real bad in the middle there. There's a there's a period of time where it just looks poopy, um, but it's, it's fun hair. A lot of work, though, so that's why I keep it pretty short. Number two for curly, having the grain composed of fibers that undulate without crossing and that often form alternating light and dark lines, as in curly maple. So this is the grain of the maple tree. I want to see a picture of this. What, what kind of grain? Fibers that undulate? Hmm, that sounds pretty interesting. Curliness is a noun. How much curliness does your hair have? How much curliness is in that wood grain? There are so many different types of curly hair, from very, very tiny curls to very, very large curls. My curls are on the bigger side. It's not about the size of the curl. Tiki taki Next is curly-coated retriever. Curly-coated has a hyphen and then the word retriever. Noun from 1885. Any of a breed of sporting dogs with a short, curly, black, or liver-colored coat. I have never heard of a dog's coat being liver-colored. But uh, yeah, that's that's like a like a dark brown, right? Isn't that what livers? Isn't that the color of liver? Mm. Might even be a. I mean, I, I would kind of think a liver might be a little green, but I think it's more on the brown side. I don't think dogs usually have green hair. Maybe we got to post a picture of a a curly coated retriever. Yeah, tiki taki. Next is. Curly, and I think you would say endive. I don't think it's endive. I think it's endive. E-N-D-I-V-E. Noun from 1978. And the synonym is the word frise. Is that how you say it? F-R-I-S-E-E. And there is an accent on the first E, down on the left, up on the right. Boop. Doop. Frise. Or frise, I think frise sounds right, but I endive. I feel like that's a, it's a, uh, it's a food or a plant or a, it's something. I know it. It's in my brain somewhere. It's it's not part of my regular day to day life, so it hasn't been ingrained. But it's curly. Tiki taki. Next is curly top. Two words. Noun from 1901. A destructive plant disease of beets caused by a single-stranded DNA virus that kills young plants and causes curling and puckering of the leaves in older plants. I feel like there was a word not all that long ago that something in the seas that also was making the plants Curly, crispy. Maybe it was no, not crispy. That doesn't make any sense. I think it was curly. Yeah, it's. In, I've read very many words, so it's hard to remember. But there was something like that. I wonder if this is related. Um, the let's see, the species, the species name of this DNA virus is beet curly top virus. Four words: beet curly top virus, of the genus Curtovirus, and then of the family. Gemini Viridae. Hmm. Lots of stuff going on there. Uh, I started preparing for the letter D. I started putting my post-it notes in the book so I know what dates 
each uh, section, each page uh, falls on, uh, planning it out, and I got to to DNA. It was either it was either DNA, the acronym, or the all spelled out. I don't remember, but uh, there's a picture of a DNA with all these little circles and things, which I will when we get there. I will try to slightly describe it, but uh, yeah, it, was, it looked like an interesting picture. Tiki Taki. Next is curmudgeon. Yeah, noun from 1568. Number one is archaic, and the synonym is miser. Just like an old, old angry person. Number two, a crusty, ill-tempered, and usually old man. Is it usually because they're usually old, or usually because they're usually a man, or both? I don't feel like I've ever... I don't think I've ever heard of a woman being called a curmudgeon, although obviously they could be as well, if they're crusty and (laughs) ill-tempered. I think it's funny to describe a person as crusty. Curmudgeonliness. Curmudgeonliness. That is a noun. And just curmudgeonly is an adjective. The origin of this word is unknown. So that's interesting. Maybe you will go to Etim online and see if there happens to be more information because I feel like there's got to be. There's got to be something. Curmudgeon is not just a word that somebody throws off the top of their head to describe a a miser or a crusty, ill-tempered person. I can't wait to become a curmudgeon. Tiki-taki. Next is cur. C-U-R-R, intransitive verb from 1677, and this is to make a murmuring sound as of a dove. So, uh, is that the sound that a dove makes? When a, Do dove experts say that a dove makes a cur sound? Is it also like a pigeon? Is that a cur? A murmuring sound, sure. I guess. Ticky tacky, ticky tacky. Next we have Kura or Kurik. Looks like you could also say Kurik. It is spelled C U R R A G H, or instead of the G, you could put a C. So that's probably the one that would be Kurik. Kura. Or curric, I think. Noun. From the 15th century. A usually large coracle used especially on the west coast of Ireland. And I don't even remember what a coracle is. So maybe we just got to quickly check that. Oh my god, I think I went straight to the right page. Um, just have to find it over here. Cora, here we go. Uh, a small boat. In ancient times. Frame, wicker... Covered usually with hide or tarpaulin. Uh, Yeah, I I literally went to the right page in one try. Um, So it's a a large coracle on the west coast of Ireland. And uh, that's that for that. Curra. Yeah, that definitely seems like an Irish word. Tiki-taki, tiki-taki, tiki-taki-taka. Next we have current. C-U-R-R-A-N-T. I would kind of want to say current, but no, it's current. I think this is the fruit. Noun from the 14th century. One, a small seedless raisin. Now, wait a minute. A raisin is a grape. So is it a small seedless grape? Anyway, it is grown chiefly in the Levant. Levant or Levant? Not sure where that is. Maybe we'll learn. Seems French, possibly? Number two, the acid edible fruit of various shrubs placed in either the saxifrage or gooseberry family. It's placed in either the saxifrage, which is spelled S-A-X-I-F-R-A-G-E, saxifrage, or the gooseberry family. And then also a plant bearing currants is also called a currant. 
Wow. Okay. The genus name of this shrub is, would you say, ribes, ribes, ribes? Probably ribes. I don't know. This is a very, I don't know if we're using the Latin pronunciation here. It's just R-I-B-E-S. So the etymology is uh, Middle English, raisin, it means raisin of courant, and it's all spelled different. Raisin is R-A-I-S-O-N, and then of courant is, well, courant is C-O-R-A-U-N-T-E, courant, and that literally means raisin of Corinth. So maybe the Levant is near Corinth. And maybe we need to put a link in the show notes that uh, gives you more information about where this is happening. Ticky tacky. Next we have currency. Noun from 1624. 1A. Circulation as a medium of exchange. 1B. General use, acceptance, or prevalence, as in... A story gaining currency. It's uh, it's gaining. It's just being generally used. It's gaining acceptance throughout the world and prevalence. One C, the quality or state of being current, as in currentness. Uh, currentness. Yes, current. N e s s. Now, are we gonna see that in here? Yeah, we probably no. Why not? Why won't we see that? Well, we actually will see uh, current, and then currentness is just another form of that. I thought it was going to maybe have its own entry. Okay, so 2A for currency, something as coins, treasury notes, and banknotes that is in circulation as a medium of exchange. So it's all these forms of money that you can exchange for goods and services, and uh, they're circulating around. It goes to one person, then it goes to a business, and that person uses it to pay pay for something else, and it just goes around and around and around. Yep, that's currency. To be paper money in circulation. And uh, if you're using a lot of paper money, you might want to wash your hands afterwards. Just a just a little note there. To see. A common article for bartering. What would that be, a common article that's not quote-unquote money? Paper money or coins or treasury notes or bank notes. Um, You can, I think we need to get to a a bartering trading society again. Ooh, is that thunder? Mmm. 2D. A medium of verbal or intellectual expression. That's currency, a medium of verbal or intellectual expression. Mm, I need some context for that one. Uh, That is it for currency. Ticky-tacky. Next we have current. So it's pronounced the same as the fruit, but this one is spelled C-U-R-R-E-N-T. This is the first form, adjective from the 14th century, 1A is archaic, and the synonyms are running and flowing. Hmm, I can't even think of how current is used for that. Running, flowing, current. Oh yeah, I guess like if a water, if a stream is running or flowing, there's a current of water. 1B1, presently elapsing, as in the current year. Or the current month or the current day. It is currently elapsing. It's it's happening right now. 1B2 is occurring in or existing at the present time. As in the current crisis. I feel like there's always a crisis going on. I mean, I can't imagine this is going to change by the time this episode airs in early June, but... I mean, there's the Ukraine crisis, and then the pandemic is still technically in some form going on, so that's a crisis, and there's probably many, many more that I don't even know about, because I feel like there's always something. But, uh, you know, 
let's let's do what we can to stop these things from happening in the first place and then stop them going on right now. We don't need crises. We don't need people fighting each other for whatever reason. I feel like it's it's pointless. I mean, there's a reason, but we gotta come. We gotta we gotta fix it. I, I can't help it. Okay, one B three for current, most recent, as in the magazine's current issue. Two, this is used as a medium of exchange. Uh, yeah, that's very similar to currency. Three, generally accepted, used, practiced, or prevalent at the moment, as in current fashions. Uh, you probably will never see me wearing the current fashions, unless it's just to be silly. Currently is an adverb. Currently, I am reading this section of the book to you. And currentness is a noun. Uh, let's see. This is from the, looks like the Anglo-French verb cour, spelled a couple of ways, or cura, which means to run. So running, what is happen, What is running right now? What's, what's the thing? Also from the Latin verb curere, and that means, uh, it doesn't say what that means, but it probably also means to run. And there's more at the word car. Because a car runs. Runs very fast. You won't be able to run as fast as a car runs. Next we have the second form of current. Noun from the 14th century. 1A. The part of a fluid body, as air or water, moving continuously in a certain direction. 1B, the swiftest part of a stream. 1C, a tidal tidal or non-tidal movement of lake or ocean water. Uh, I will maybe come back to this depending on where we've got. I don't know much about currents, just a little bit. 1D, flow marked by force or strength. 2A for current, a tendency or course of events that is usually the result of an interplay of forces, as in currents of public opinion. Tendency, or yes, that's definitely thunder. Ooh-wee. A tendency or course of events, I'm just rereading this, uh, that is usually the result of an interplay of forces. So there's an interplay of forces that uh, makes uh, the course of events happen. The currents of public opinion. Okay. To be a prevailing mood, and the synonym is strain. Hmm. A prevailing mood. Yeah, but what, what is the mood? What is your mood right now? I'm not entirely sure how strain fits into that. Uh, strain. What's your, what's the strain in your, uh, what's strain in your brain? Number three, a flow of electric charge. And then also the rate of such flow. Yeah, electricity is going to flow in a direction. I, I don't know enough about electricity, but it's going to flow in a direction. And, uh, and, and also how much, how much flow is there? So every piece of electronics uh, has a different sort of current it's AC and DC and uh, that's all I know. That's that's my electricity knowledge is tapped out. A synonym for everything is the word tendency. And then back to the water thing. Uh, let's see a tidal or non-tidal movement of lake or ocean water. I don't know how this happens. It's probably very similar to wind in the air, but for some reason there there are currents in the water. Some of the water might be relatively still, but then there's one part that just flows real fast for some reason. Um, in the movie Finding Nemo, there is a current. Uh, I can't remember what they call it. There is there is a specific name for that one, but they, they're all throughout the world, and uh, it's just a, a section of water that just, phew, just it just goes. 
Uh, so if you're like swimming in the ocean, you got to be aware of these tidal, these waters, these flows that just go quickly. You could get caught up into it and it's very bad. Um, and I, yeah, again, I'm not sure how or why it happens, but it's pretty fascinating. All right, we're almost at the end. Ticky tacky, tick, tick, tock. Next is current assets. Two words, noun from circa 1909. Assets of a short term nature that are readily convertible to cash. It just, uh, it's like, hey, give me some cash for this thing. I got my, I got my current assets right here. We got one more for this episode. Tick tock key. It is curricle. Yeah, curricle. C U R R I C L E. Noun from 1752. And it is a two wheeled chaise, usually drawn by two horses. It's like a, it's like a little, um, uh, I was going to say chariot, but uh, kind of like a chariot, but I'm thinking more of a, what are they, what are they, just a, you know, a, the thing. You know, it's the thing where you sit in the thing and then it gets pulled. Hopefully, hopefully, I mean, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the horses get pulling these things, but it is. Well, okay, here, etymology. It is from the Latin curriculum, which looks like the word curriculum, which means running or chariot. Two-wheel chaise. So you're just hanging out in it, and then the horses pull it, I guess. All right. So in this episode, we had curl up, curly, curly-coated retriever, curly endive, curly top, curmudgeon, cur, cura or curric, current, currency, current, current, current assets, and curricle. Hmm. <laughs> I I mean, you know, I think I may. I'm, I was tempted to pick curmudgeon because I just, well, A, I think it's a fun word and we don't know where it came from. And uh, I think, you know, not that curmudgeons are like the most nice people in the world, but I think they're kind of funny. Uh, but I think I'm going to pick curl up as the word of the episode because it sounds really great to just curl up by the fire like a cat or a dog and maybe with a good book or just nap. Gonna curl up by the fire with a book. Oh, yeah. That is it. That's it. Um, let's see. It's been a little while since I recorded. Um, so quickly, I can say I watched some movies. Last night with my family, I watched, because uh, my niece wants to watch all the Spider-Man movies, we watched the first of the Andrew Garfield uh, movies, The Amazing Spider-Man. That was fun. I hadn't seen that one in a while. And we watched recently Super Bob. Highly recommend Super Bob. Definitely go check that out. Uh, Gremlins 2. We rewatched Gremlins because we, Sharon and I, hadn't seen that since probably we were kids. And uh, it's just bonkers crazy. After you watch it, you have to uh, watch the Key and Peel sketch about it as well. I don't remember if I mentioned this, but I don't think I have. Um, probably seen some other ones, but uh, those are those are the big standouts in my brain. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I think that's a fine place to end this. I hope I hope that uh, one of the last couple of episodes had a guest. I don't know because I haven't recorded him yet, but fingers crossed that it happened. Um, quickly, I must say, rate and review, share and subscribe. Find me on social media at Dictionary Pod or at Speedjampar. Go watch this on YouTube. Join the Patreon if you want to spare a few bucks my way. You get episodes real early. Google Voice, call it, leave a message. Email dictionarypod at gmail.com. You can write a short little intro song ditty thing, 10 to 15 seconds. It's all you know, you know all the stuff. Just have fun with it and listen. Just share it. Tell people about the show and go buy some merchandising. Hey, that's it. I got. That's all I got to say for you. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. How are you doing? Welcome to the Dictionary, the podcast where Spencer reads a little bit of the book 
and then make some silly comments about some stuff or statements or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's just, just going through all of life a uh, little bit by little bit. All right. Uh, this episode is uh, the beginning of page 307. And the first word is curricular. C-U-R-R-I-C-U-L-A-R. Adjective from circa 1909. Of or relating to a curriculum. What is a curriculum? It is curriculum. Noun. From 1824. One. The courses offered by an educational institution. All of the courses from one educational institution is the curriculum. That is, that is everything. It could range. It depends on the, the institution. Maybe they specialize in something. Maybe they've just got general knowledge. You got to go get the book or check online and see what they offer. Maybe there's something that they offer that you didn't even know you'd be interested in. Number two. A set of courses constituting an area of specialization. So if you want to specialize in studying something, the courses that are all part of that specialization are going to be your curriculum. But, and I don't know why it's not in here, but also just the, uh, the, 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 the let's see, the, the plan of a class through a quarter or a semester, I think that would also be the curriculum. What's the curriculum of this individual class? Going to take a test at this time. We're going to study this at this time. That would be a curriculum too, wouldn't it? I'm pretty sure it would be. So this is a Latin word. Uh, we kind of learned that in yesterday's episode. Um, and it means running or course. Or maybe a course that is running. So it all makes sense. I don't remember the sound effect I did, but it was very loud. Toopadabow! Next is, okay, this is the one you can pronounce this many ways. It's two words, curriculum vitae, or just curriculum, curriculum, curriculum. And then the second word can also be pronounced vitae or vitae. So many ways. Vitae, 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 curriculum, vitae, I think is the way that I want to say it. Oh, by the way, that second word is spelled V-I-T-A-E. Noun from 1902. A short account of one's career and qualifications prepared typically by an applicant for a position. Uh, so this is basically a, a resume. You you gotta you gotta write down what how why you're qualified for this job that you want. What have you done in your career in the past? Maybe the schools that you attended, and uh, you say, hey, I, I, this is why I should have the job. Here you go. Here's my curriculum vitae. And this is Latin, and it means course of life. Course of life. Vitae, or however you want to pronounce that, means life. But then more specifically, the word ones is in there. Course of one's life. A person's life. Your life. Yeah. Uh, this, this podcast, when it's over, will be my curriculum vitae. Okay, next word is... Curiari. Is that it? Curiari. 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 Close enough. C U R R I E R Y. Curiari. Noun from circa 1889. One. The trade of a courier of leather. So, um, the person who is uh, couriering leather. Uh, is uh, is is in the couriery. Maybe their shop is also called a couriery. Yeah, number two, a place where currying is done, and that one is spelled C U R R Y I N G, 
couriering, and we're probably going to learn more about that soon because we have a few forms of the word curry. I should I just do a different sound effect for each one in this episode? No. Currish is next. Currish. Adjective from the 15th century. Number one, this synonym is ignoble. I-G, noble. Ignoble. Two, resembling a cur. C-U-R. Uh, let's see. Can we can we find that one real quick? Because we're not that far from it. Uh cur 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 uh was mongrel or inferior dog surly or cowardly fellow uh so currish is uh resembling a cur a dog like that or something and then the synonym this makes sense mongrel currishly is an adverb that's kind of like that mario one i did a little while ago Next word is the first form of the word curry, C-U-R-R-Y. There are a lot of food dishes called curries, but I feel like they're very different. There's lots of different types. And so people say I like curry, but which which curry? I don't know enough about my curries, but I do like them. But which one? And from which, which region of the world? I feel like they're maybe they're not as different as I think they are. Let's learn. Uh, this first form is the verb uh, from the 13th century, and I think it is just transitive. So, number one, to clean the coat of, as a horse, with a curry comb. You got a curry comb, your horse needs cleaning, you got to clean the coat, so you are currying. Two, to treat, especially by incorporating oil or grease. And the thing that you might be treating is tanned leather. And uh, yeah, that, that goes back to our curry That's the place where this currying is done. Uh, treating the tanned leather. Three, the synonyms are beat and thrash. Hmm. Courier is a noun. Oh, okay. Curry favor. That is a, a little sub-definition thing we got here. Oh, yeah, it's a it's a phrase. Curry favor. And that means to seek to gain favor by flattery or attention. Please give me flattery or attention. What can I do to curry some flavor? <laughs> flavor. See, that's what I thought it said. Curry flavor. Which does makes some sense but not in this context the etymology for curry favor is from the middle english currien favel and that means to curry a chestnut horse so i guess that would be just brushing them with a curry comb and how i mean if you're doing that to a horse does that mean that the Horse is going to flatter you or give you attention? I mean, you're giving them attention. Maybe they, they love it so much that they're going to give you some attention too. That, that one is kind of odd. Curry favor. What's the etymology for just the word curry here? It is from the Anglo-French verb courier, which means to prepare or curry. From the vulgar Latin Conredare, which is from com plus a base of Germanic origin, which is akin to the Gothic gareths, which means arrayed. Arrayed? It's not very helpful. There's more at the word ready. Ready, set, go, 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 go. Now we have the second form of curry. You could spell it with a Y or an I-E. Noun from 1681. One. A food, dish, or sauce in Indian cuisine seasoned with a mixture of pungent spices. Also, a food or dish seasoned with curry powder. 
And then number two is just the synonym, curry powder. You put some curry in your curry to make it a curry. And again, like I said, this is very good stuff. But uh, but yeah, this specifically calls out Indian. And yes, that's very true. But, I, but it's also, I feel like I go to a, a Pan-Asian place and they have curries and... Don't, uh, doesn't England have curries too? Or is that the same as the Indian curry? I don't know. I, like, I'm not a, a curry expert, but I, I need to try more. All right. So that, oh, um, there is etymology. It is from the Tamil word, kari, K-A-R-I. And that word is, let's see, it says, or a cognate word in a Dravidian language. So it's the Tamil word kari or a cognate word in a Dravidian language. And that is not very helpful to me because I'm I'm not up on my Dravidian languages. (laughs) Next is the third form of curry. Transitive verb from 1839. To flavor or cook with curry powder or a curry sauce. Curry that curry. I don't know what sound effect to do. Pew, pew, pew. Here's curry comb. One word, noun from 1573. A comb made of rows of metallic teeth or serrated ridges and used especially to curry horses. Curry comb is also a transitive verb. Is this the only kind of brush that people use on uh, on horses, or are there other kinds of brushes? Why is this one different? Maybe we should post a picture. But um, metallic teeth sounds like it wouldn't be very comfortable, but I think they have pretty thick skin, uh, so they probably like it. Unless, yeah, this is live horses, so I, they probably like it. I hope, I hope they like it. Beep, bow, bow, bow. That's the sound effect there. Next is curry powder. Two words. Noun from 1810. A condiment consisting of several pungent ground spices. Like what kind of spices are in this curry powder? Well, we have cayenne pepper, fenugreek, and turmeric. Fenugreek is F E N U. G-R-E-E-K, and I have never heard of that fenugreek, but now I'm curious. Um, what what other spices might be in there? Maybe we should put a link in the show notes uh, to list, because there's got to be other ones, I have to imagine. Yeah, good stuff. We might even have some of this powder. We just throw it in a thing. beep a boo Next is curse. Yeah. C-U-R-S-E. First form, noun from before the 12th century. One, a prayer or invocation for harm or injury to come upon one. And the synonym is imprecation? This is not a word I'm familiar with. Imprecation. That is an interesting word. But yes, If you want to cause injury or harm on someone, you can just pray for it or invoke it to the heavens, and then maybe it will come true, although not necessarily. Number two, something that is cursed or accursed. Cursed or accursed. And it is a curse. I hope I don't don't have anything that's cursed. Has anybody given me anything that's cursed? I don't think so. Number three, evil or misfortune that comes as if in response to imprecation or as retribution. So you can put a curse on someone and then the thing that goes to them that's uh, evil or bad would also be the curse. You you put, what's that song? There's a song. You put a curse on me? No. You dropped a bomb on me? No. Uh curse there's a song i know it in my head curse number four a cause of great harm or misfortune 
And the synonym is torment. And uh, number five for curse. I'm not, I've probably heard this, wouldn't necessarily have thought of this, but uh, this is definitely, I'm sure many, many people have said this. Um, and uh, it's just the synonym menstruation. Some people get very frustrated by this thing that happens every month. And so they call it the curse. Yes, it says it is used with the word the, the curse. Hmm. I understand the frustration, and I am sorry that people have to deal with this. We're going to move on to the next word. Blue, 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 blue. It is the curse word again. It is the second form. This is a verb from, again, before the 12th century. We are starting with transitive. One, to use profanely insolent language against. And the synonym is blaspheme. As in, curse God and die. And that is a quote from the Bible. It's Job 2, 9, and then it says R-E-B, and I don't know or remember what that stands for. R-E-B. You profanely insolent language. Uh, number 2A. To call upon divine or supernatural power to send injury upon. And uh, yeah, that's just like the number one definition for the first form of curse. A prayer or invocation for harm or injury. Okay, that's... W okay, so now we're on to... Oh, we have an, ex uh, an example there. Was cursed and fears he will die. Somebody called upon the divine or supernatural power to send injury upon him, and he fears that he might die. I, I sure hope he doesn't. That would be very sad. To be, to execrate in fervent and often profane terms, as in, cursed by future generations unless we act now. So this is a thing that we're dealing with now with climate change. And uh, we currently will be cursed by the younger people if we don't do anything now because we are creating a world that might not be so great to live in with climate change. If we don't do something now, they will be very angry at us that we didn't do something now. And I don't want them angry at us. I also more so don't want them to uh, live in a world that is very difficult to live in. So let's do something now. I'm looking at you, capitalists and corporations and countries and companies. Please do something now. You know you can. You just don't want to. Number three, to bring great evil upon. This is still for curse. The synonym is afflict. As in, a land cursed with famine. Typically, I think it's I think it's pretty common that if you see the word curse in something, it's probably not a very good thing. You don't want to be cursed. You don't want your land cursed. You don't want something cursing you. Okay, we have one intransitive which says, to utter imprecations. And the synonym is swear. As in, Cursing loudly. We will get to curse words various at various times throughout this podcast. We've already seen a couple of them, I think. And there's more coming. Uh, let's see. The ed there's no etymology. So, we have to now say, boo 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 Next word is cursed. You could spell it, C-U-R-S-E-D or C-U-R-S-T. Adjective from the 13th century. Being under or deserving a curse. If somebody has put a curse on you, you are cursed. Maybe you deserve to be cursed. What did you do to deserve a curse? Cursedly is an adverb and cursedness is a noun. 
Boop, 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 boop. Next is cursive. First form, adjective from circa 1784. The synonyms are... Okay, there's no numbers, just letters. Uh, The synonyms are running and coursing. Just like we saw before, uh, curriculum, current. Um, So that's what that means, running or coursing, as A. And then for A, we're talking about writing, like writing on paper. And it means flowing often with the strokes of successive characters joined and the angles rounded. Cursive writing, all the letters run together. It's one long course of the pen. They just flow right into each other, and they have, oh, thunder, and they have rounded angles because it's much easier and quick to uh, to write in a, a rounded way instead of sharp angles. Sometimes there's sharp angles, but a lot of it's pretty rounded. I learned this in third grade. Uh, didn't really use it a whole lot after that. I almost never write things on paper anymore, so my handwriting has always been pretty bad, but it's even worse now, I think. And uh, I don't even know if I could write cursive if I tried. But uh, I think it's good if you're not writing... You should, you should just write a little bit every day just to keep up that muscle because I think it's pretty good to do. Do kids even learn cursive anymore? They, I hope they do. It's a good, good to learn another way to write, but it's not, uh, it's not like it used to be. Back in the day, like when my grandma was little, that's just, that's just how everybody wrote. It was the standard. Then we have B. And this is having a flowing, easy, impromptu character. So is that like your personality? A flowing, easy, impromptu character. So if you just are easy, just go with the flow, whatever, hey man, cool, you you have a cursive character. Hmm. I think I'm in general like that. But when it comes to plans, my brain does not do so well when plans change. It just takes a little time for me to process that I got I to gotta adjust. Cursive. Cursively is an adverb, and cursiveness is a noun. Yeah, this is from the La- Middle Latin cursivus, or cursivus, which means running, from the Latin verb currere, which means to run. Everything just running together. Boo-boo-boo. Last word for this episode is the second form of cursive. Noun from 1838. One, a manuscript written in cursive writing. And then also just cursive writing is cursive. The whole manuscript written in cursive writing is called a cursive? Is that what people say? That seems odd. Just call it a manuscript. Two, a style of printed letter resembling handwriting. Uh, on computers, there's fonts that are in cursive just to make it look like it has been handwritten in cursive. Those were all of the words. So we had curricular, curriculum, curriculum, vitae, 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 curiary, currish, Curry, 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 curry comb, curry powder, curse, curse, cursed, cursive, and cursive. Okay, Ooh, I think I gotta pick curry as the word of the episode because I just I like I like a curry, I like a good curry. I don't eat a lot of them, but yeah, maybe next time I go to a place I'll get a curry. I like I like hot stuff, so maybe I'll get a red curry, but I don't know. There's something about the yellow curry that's just very tasty and creamy to me. I like it. Give me some curry. What kind of curry? Maybe a yellow curry or some other kind of curry. Curry, curry, curry. All right, I think that's it. I got some stuff to do, so I'm going to go do that. Thank you very much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. 
Welcome to the dictionary. Ooh, this TikTok thing is not working as well as I hoped it was. Who cares? Hey, this is Spencer, and I'm really glad you're here because I want to tell you about the first word in this episode. Yeah, this TikTok thing failed. Um, it is cursor. C U R S O R. Noun from 1594. A movable item used to mark a position as a a transparent slide with a line attached to a slide rule. B. A visual cue, as a flashing rectangle, on a video display that indicates position, as for data entry. The etymology. Latin. It means runner. And that's it. And I'm going to end this video. And while I am clicking the buttons to end it, um, I need to I need to stall a little bit. Um, so we I got I got things to say about cursor, don't I? Um, we we see this all the time on our phones. There's the little blinky thing when you're typing in your text on the computer. There's the arrow. Depending on what program you're using or what you're doing in the program, it might change. Um, let's transparent slide with a line. Attached to a slide rule. I don't think people use these very much anymore. That's the uh, the A version, the A definition. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's there to mark your position. So I think that's probably the first usage the uh, on the slide rule. And then it became a thing in the digital world, on the computer, the phone, whatever it is, to show you where you are. Yeah. Okay. Thwomp. Next word is cursorial. Cursorial. The whole book practically just closed on me. This is an adjective from 1836. Adapted to or involving running. Adapted to or involving running. Cursorial? I have not heard this used, I don't think, ever. But we can we know that it means running, or it's related to running, because if we look back at cursor, like I just said, it just means a runner or running. It's all it's all about running. Thwomp. Next is you could say cursory or cursory. Two syllables or three syllables. Cursory. Adjective from 1601. Rapidly and often superficially performed or produced. The synonym is hasty, as in a cursory glance. I just looked at it quickly. I skimmed it. Not too much. Didn't didn't really pay attention. It was just a very rapid and superficial thing that I did. Not always the best idea. Sometimes it's appropriate. Cursory glance. That's all it is. A synonym again. There's another one. It is the word superficial. Cursorily is an adverb, and cursoriness is a noun. And again, this is from the lower Latin cursorius, which means of running. It's all about running. You're just running through the thing hastily and quickly. Thwomp. Next is curt. C-U-R-T. Adjective from 1630. Your name might be Kurt. I don't know how that's related to what we're about to read, but it might be. 1A. Are you sparing of words? Or are you the synonym terse? Terse and curt. Very, very short. Not a lot of words. This book is not curt. Sometimes I can be curt. Sometimes I can be... Loquacious. I think that would be the opposite. You, many, many words. As in the example, wrote curse precise sentence. Somebody wrote down sentences that were very curt and precise. And I don't even know if I used the word curt there, but I fixed it eventually. 1B. Marked by rude or peremptory shortness. Peremptory shortness. Same idea, just very, just not a lot going on. Short, terse. Uh, and a synonym for that one is brusque. B-U, no, B-R-U, 
S Q U E, as in a curt refusal. Refusing something in a rude or peremptory short way. I don't really like it when people are like that. Go into a, a restaurant or whatever, a place, you, you want to get a little, um, you want your, your customer service to be a little bit better. Just, just, you know, don't be so curt. That's what I think. Number two, shortened in linear dimension. And a synonym for everything is the word bluff. Bluff? What kind of bluff are we talking about here? Curtly is an adverb, and curtness is a noun. So, this is not related to running things like we just had. This is from the Latin word curtus, which means mutilated or curtailed. And there's more at the word shear, S-H-E-A-R. So, curtailed, so it's been cut off. That's our next word. We're going to learn about that soon. But yeah, I think it's more like it's been cut off at the end or, or cut off too early and then mutilated. Eh, you know, th- that word has a whole lot of meanings. But in here, we can think of it as, um, again, it's just sort of being cut off and not, not, the, not the full thing that you want. That's how my brain is processing that. Boomp. Next is curtail. This is a verb from 1580, and it looks like it is just transitive. To make less by or as if by cutting off or away some part. Yeah, kind of like I said, it's just it cut off. It's uh, not finished. To make less by or as if by cutting off or away some part. As in, curtail the power of the executive branch. Getting rid of some of the power that the executive branch has. Also is in curtail inflation. Which that is definitely something that's going on right now. Oh boy. Why am I so tired? It's because I worked a long day and my brain is pooped. So yeah, uh, inflation is going. We got to curtail it somehow. I don't know how the people in the power positions can do that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand any of it. We have a synonym. It is the word shorten. Curtailer is a noun. A curtailer is going to tailor your pants too short. Um, Okay, this is by folk etymology from the earlier word curtal, which means to dock an animal's tail. That's why the word tail is in there. From curtal, uh, which is a noun, animal with a docked tail is a curtal, C-U-R-T-A-L. Uh, and we are going to get to that at the end of this episode. So that's, it was curtal first. Uh, actually, you'd say curtal. Yeah, curtal. And uh, then it became curtail because it was about the tail. And I don't like the practice of cutting off an animal's tail or even just a portion of it. Fwomp. Next is curtailment. We added an M-E-N-T. Curtailment. Noun from 1794. The act of curtailing. Also, the state of being curtailed. So many yawns in my face. Fwomp. Next is the first form of curtain. Curtain, curtain, you can emphasize the T if you want. Noun from the 14th century. One, a hanging screen, usually capable of being drawn back or up, especially window drapery. Number two, a device or agency that conceals or acts as a barrier. And that one you can compare to iron curtain. Doesn't say if it's a synonym, might be an antonym. Uh, I've heard this phrase, a device or agency that conceals or acts as a barrier. Yeah, iron curtain, I feel like that's just the longer version of this one. 
more, you know, we added a word, uh, the Iron Curtain. It's the idea that it's it's a thing that is covering up something and you can't get through it. It's it's like a firewall. It's iron. You're stuck. You're stuck on the other side. 3A, the part of a, mm, I lost my place, uh, a bastioned, bastioned? The part of a bastioned front that connects two neighboring bastions. 3B1, a similar stretch of plain wall. 3B2, a non-bearing exterior wall. Does that mean non-bearing? Does that mean that it's non-weight bearing? It's just a wall, but there's nothing on top of it? 4A, the movable screen separating the stage from the auditorium of a theater. 4B, the ascent or opening, as at the beginning of a play, of a stage curtain. So the, the, the curtain, the physical curtain is called the curtain, but then also the opening of the curtain, like at the beginning of a play, is also called curtain. Also, its descent or closing at the end of the play is also called curtain. You know, you've heard people say, it's curtain, curtain, curtain. The word sounds weird. Curtain, yeah. Sometimes they go they go off to the sides, left and right. Sometimes they raise up and down. I think that those are really the only two uh, ways that curtains on a stage go. Um, 4C, the final situation, line, or scene of an act or play. I guess that's called a curtain. 4D, the time at which a theatrical performance begins. You might hear people say, when's curtain? When does, I think that's all they say, when's curtain? Oh, it's at 6.03. 4E, this one is plural, and it uh, has a couple synonyms. The first one is the word end, E-N-D. Oh, that's curtains. It's the end. But then also, especially, the synonym death. It's, so we're, we're using the idea of the end of the play when the curtain goes down. Uh, the, the, the play is a metaphor for your life, and the curtain coming down is the end of your life, which is death. Curtains, that is curtains on that person. As in, it will be curtains for us if we're caught. If we're caught, we will die. Curtainless is an adjective there might be some stages that have no curtains. Let's see. It is from hmm, uh, Latin cohors, which means enclosure or court. Uh, there's more at the word court. So uh, how how is that related to court? I'm not sure. But uh, enclosure, I don't know. I Whenever I think of curtain, I obviously think of a play. Uh how it's it's enclosing the stage within the curtains maybe the stage is the court i'm just making up stuff uh yeah the music box theater in chicago where i was recently uh they have some very nice red just your standard red curtains and uh david lynch he loves red curtains Usually red, sometimes maybe blue, but typically red. And uh, he's used it in a number of things. And uh, yeah, I think he just loves the idea of, uh, he just loves the the red curtains, the play, the show, the stage, all of it. Fwomp. That sound, fwomp, is the sound of the curtain falling down quickly. We have the second form of curtain. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to furnish with or as if with curtains. So is that a stage? Is that your windows? Is that, it could be anything. You could, if you curtain, if you put curtains on a thing, you have curtained it. Two, to veil or shut off with 
or as if with a curtain. Just close it off with a curtain. Fwomp. Next is curtain call. Two words, noun from 1884. An appearance by a performer as after the final curtain of a play in response to the applause of the audience. The show ends, the curtain comes down, the audience goes crazy, they want to see that performer or the whole the whole uh, cast come back out to do a curtain call. We have called you from beyond the curtain to please come uh, bow or say hello or wave. We just want you to come back out. This is your curtain call, please. Fwomp. Next is curtain lecture. Lecture. Two words. Noun from uh, 1633. A private lecture by a wife to her husband. (laughs) I was not familiar with this. Um, The etymology says it is from its original, or it's originally being given behind the curtains of a bed. So, you know, 1633, that's the time when there were probably, in in many houses, uh, curtains around a bed. I think of uh, A Christmas Carol. That's a very dated piece of um, media, you know, because there's lots different forms of that. Um, but, you know, what was that? Is that 1800s? Even back in the 1800s, some people had curtains around their bed. And uh, so <laughs> I think this is funny. Um, the wife is mad at her husband about something, maybe. She's given him a private lecture. And especially back at that time, uh, for, you know, a few hundred years or more, um, maybe it was not so uh, appropriate for a woman to tell her husband how she feels other than in private. So she got to give him a curtain lecture. Do people still use this? I hope they do. Fwomp. Next is curtain razor. Two words with a hyphen and razor is R-A-I-S-E-R, like the curtain is being raised, not the razor that shaves your hair. This is a noun from 1886. One, a short play, usually of one scene, that is presented before the main full-length drama. Hmm. So, uh, why? Okay, well, let's read number two. A usually short preliminary to a main event. So that one seems like it came after the uh, the short play. So they took the idea of a short thing before the main thing. So would an appetizer be a, a curtain raiser? A, a short preliminary to the main event? I think that makes sense. Now, instead of saying appetizer or hors d'oeuvres, I will say, let's get some curtain raisers. It does not say why it is called curtain raiser. So a couple of ideas. Is it because the curtain raises to do the play just for a short little bit and then it closes? It's just oh, up and down, all that, all, all that's all it is. Or is it because the play is performed in front of the closed curtain and then when this short play is done, then the curtain raises? If you know, please let me know because I don't know. Fwomp. Next is curtain wall. Two words, noun from 1853. A non-bearing exterior wall between columns or piers. Uh, yeah, again, we've got this non-bearing. I just have to assume that there's nothing on top of it, or at least nothing of importance. Um, a curtain wall... If it's between columns, then maybe they would put a curtain between the columns? I don't know. This one's a little confusing to me. Fwomp. Next is Kirtal. C-U-R-T-A-L. We learned about this when we had curtail. So this is an adjective from 1576. One is obsolete. 
In fact, all of these are not used anymore. One is obsolete, having a docked tail. Two is also obsolete, and the synonyms are brief and curtailed. Three is archaic, wearing a short frock. Wearing a short frock. So the the frock obviously has been curtailed because it is short, or it was just made that way. But uh, but yes, you can be curtail if you wear one, and if you are an animal and somebody docked off part of your tail, unfortunately, then you are also curtail. Uh, yeah, etymology just means short. Fuum. We have one more for this episode. It is curtail. Ax, and uh, that is two words. It's curtail is spelled the same way as the last one, C U R T A L or C U R T L E, and ax is just A X. There's no E at the end of ax. It is a noun. Oh, God, this I, I am worried about where this is going. Um, noun from circa 1580. Uh, it is archaic, and the synonym is just cutlass, C-U-T-L-A-S-S, and you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait how many days? Not a lot. Not a lot of days. Uh, let's see. Cutlass is right there, and that is uh, that day. So it's uh, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, like seven, seven days. A week. A week from now, you will have cutlass. And the only thing I can think of is that it's the axe used to to cut off an animal's tail, which, again, I do not like. So, the words we had today were cursor, cursorial, cursory, curt, curtail, curtailment, curtain, curtain, curtain call, curtain lecture, curtain razor, curtain wall, curdle, and curdle axe. Uh, let's see, I was thinking about picking curtain just because it's just a nice, uh, you know, uh, th- what what am I trying to say? It's uh, visually, it's very nice. It, it signifies a lot. It's very metaphorical. You could think about it metaphorically if you want. But um, I think just because I was, uh, it was kind of a fun one, um, I'm going to pick curtain lecture as the word of the episode. Um, and you know, This has very specific genderized words in there. A lecture by a wife to her husband. Why couldn't it be the husband to the wife? Why do we have to use these words? A lot of people I know are not using those words. They just use partner. Um, Man, woman, non-binary, doesn't matter. So, But it's just a lecture, a private lecture from one partner to another uh, that they don't want other people to see because it's private. What do they talk about? Do you have these? We, I don't think Sharon and I really have these types of things. Uh, you know, if we're if we're out in public and she she got to say something, she might just say it, or vice versa. Depends on who we're with, though. Curtain lecture, curtain lecture, sitting on your bed, surrounded by curtains, getting lectured. All right, that is it for the words. Um, I will quickly say that very soon, very, very soon, in just a few weeks, uh, you, I will be posting an episode, a non, non-word, well, there will be words in it, um, non-definitions. It's an abnormal episode. What's going to happen, which I will be recording in uh, like four days from now, is Jonah, my friend Jonah, who was on an episode uh, a little while ago, He decided that he would like to interview me about uh, the show, about this podcast. And I said, sure, why not? Let's do that. So he's going to interview me. I don't really know what he's going to ask. And uh, then I'm going to air it the day after the last of the C episodes. So uh, this will be July 1st. It will air uh, as long as everything goes according to plan. And... um, He's actually going to be in town, so we're even going to record it in person, which I'm very excited about. And uh, yeah, that's that's something that you can look forward to. I have no idea 
what's going to happen or how it's going to go, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it should be fun. Uh, yeah. Um, I did. Well, maybe I'll say that for the next thing. All right. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. I love you all so much. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. If you love this podcast so much, I strongly encourage you to click on the merchandising link in the show notes so you can buy some things with the logo on it, the logo of this podcast. You you got to show off your love for it. You could get a t-shirt. You could get a mask because that's a thing that we all wear now. Phone covers onesies, magnets, stickers, s- sweatshirts, other th- other good things. Mugs, probably, yes. Mouse pads, maybe. Do people still use mice? I do. Let's talk about the words. The first one in this episode is courtesy. C-U-R-T-E-S-Y. Courtesy. I feel like the courtesy, when I think of that word, I think of C-O-U-R-T, and now I'm I'm kind of blanking. Is that, that is a word, isn't it? Courtesy with a C-O-U. Well, we we should just go do a quick little, uh, a quick little double check here. Where is the C-O-U section? Here we go. We're getting close. Uh, da, 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 courtesy. It's it's very possible I haven't even recorded it yet because I have skipped a few episodes waiting to see if I can get some guests. Ah, yes, here we go. Courtesy. Um, so that is different. Have I recorded this? I must have. God, that was a long time ago. Okay, so this is the courtesy with no O, and it is a noun from 1523. A husband's interest upon the death of his wife in the real property of an estate that she either solely owned or inherited, provided they bore a child capable of inheriting the state. Wow. Okay, compare to the word dower, D-O-W-E-R, which I believe would be the similar thing for a woman instead of a man. Uh, you know, okay, we're, we're using these old terms because, yes, this is from fif- the 1500s. Okay, so let's break this down. Uh, Wife dies uh, upon the death of his wife in the real property of an estate that she either solely owned or inherited. So a woman owns a property. She either inherited it or she bought it. And she, they had a child who could also inherit this estate, but she dies and then the husband gets a portion of it or gets something it's uh it's a little confusing but it's something to do with all that that i just said and read hmm yeah this is definitely a thing that i feel like does not exist anymore or possibly might exist in a few cultures in the world but not uh not much okay there's a funny thing happening right now i'm on the bed uh i I flipped over a blanket which covered a cat and the other cat came in and she is now climbing over the other cat which is under a blanket and she's trying to find a good... This is going to be very interesting to see what happens. She's sniffing. She probably smells the other cat. I have to imagine. Oh! (laughs) Cat number one, Audrey, just made a sound like, why are you standing on me right now? Uh, So, okay, I'll keep you updated. The sound effect will be boop, 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 boop. The second word, I'm not going to number these words. The next word is curtilage, C-U-R-T-I-L-A-G-E, curtilage. Noun from the 14th century, a piece of ground as a yard or courtyard within the fence surrounding a house. So the yard or the courtyard is uh, surrounding the house, but it is within the fenced area. And that is a curtilage. Um, This is from Anglo-French, courtil, which means garden or curtilage. Also from court, which means court. So it's, you know, it's a court. 
By the way, for courtesy, the etymology just says that it is from the Middle English word courtesy, which means courtesy. And that is the one spelled with the with the O. Uh, so it's like a courtesy to the man. Here you go. Here's a thing for you because your wife died. Maybe. Boop, 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 boop. Next word. Curtsy. First form. C-U-R-T-S-Y or S-E-Y. Noun from 1533. All right. Just a little update on the cats. Bailey, the second cat, is now walking away from cat number one, Audrey trying to find a place to lay down. So, curtsy, uh, if I didn't say the year, it's 1533. An act of civility, respect, or reverence made mainly by women and consisting of a slight lowering of the body with bending of the knees. Sometimes I think you will see them cross cross their legs somehow. Maybe one leg goes out to the side. Uh, their knees are bent. Sometimes they will flare their arms out to the side. Maybe they will pick up a little uh, part of the dress and lift it up a little bit. There's lots of ways to curtsy. Um, but yes, obviously this doesn't have to be by women. It does say mainly by women. Although I think hundreds of years ago, all, you know, one... One, two, five hundred years ago. Uh, see, see, back then, uh, men were the one who would maybe wear dresses or wear heels or wear wigs. Everything was sort of flip-flopped from what we stereotypically think of these days. Uh, and so I believe back in the day, they would also curtsy. Things change. It evolves. If you want to curtsy, curtsy. It's a much more fun and flamboyant way to uh, to give civility, respect, or reverence to somebody. Boop, 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 boop. Next word is the second form of curtsy. Intransitive verb from circa 1553, and this is just to make a curtsy. Uh, that's an alternative of curtsy with an O. So maybe in court, courtsy. In court, they would do this, uh, do this thing, this movement. Boop, 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 boop. Next word is curule. It's a little hard to say. Curule. C-U-R-U-L-E. Curule. Adjective from 1600. I'm trying to slow down. It's hard. One. Relating to or being a high-ranking dignitary of ancient Rome entitled to occupy a special chair. Number two, of relating to or being a chair or seat reserved for Romans of high rank that resembles a backless stool with curved legs. So this is, so the first one is the person, and then the second one is the, literally the seat that they sit on it resembles a backless stool with curved legs also of relating to or being a 19th century seat with legs of a similar style and uh, maybe we got to find a picture of one of these cure rules uh, just just the uh, the chair or the stool not the person this is perhaps uh, this is from the Latin curulis which is perhaps an alternative of curulis with two R's, which means of a chariot. Also from curus, which means chariot, from curere, which means to run. So the chariot is running, but but how does the thing of a chariot, how is that related to the person who is a dignitary or the thing that they sat on? I think in a chariot you're standing, but it's all from the same area and time period, so I'll let that slide. Beep, boop, boop, boop. Next word is curvaceous. You can spell it two ways. C-U-R-V-A-C-E-O-U-S. Or you can replace the E with an I. Adjective from circa 1935. 
having or suggesting the curves of a well-proportioned feminine figure. Well-proportioned. So, I mean, that's a very judgmental statement, isn't it? I think that what they mean by that is... How how do you put this? Um, that the proportions of the hips to the waist to the bust to uh, mostly that is quote unquote standard or typical, and of course that doesn't. Well, anyway, we're getting to the judgment side of things, but for for this word specifically, curvaceous. That is what you mean, because there are curves. It goes out and in and out and in, and that's that's the whole point of this word. So, we have an example. A curvaceous actress. But then broadly, for the definition, it is having a smoothly curving shape. Yes, that's what we're talking about. It curves. It's not straight up and down or w- some other shape. It curves. Uh, and of course, this can be Male or female, typically men don't have a curvaceous figure, a feminine figure, but that's a, that's just a very, uh, that's a generalization. So specifically with this last one, having a smooth curving shape, the example here is a curvaceous coastline. So this has nothing to do with a person. The coastline can be curvaceous because it curves. It, it like S curves left and right and yes. Uh, let's see, there is no etymology. I think it's a very nice shape. I think all, all the shapes are nice. Boop, 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 boop. Next is curvature. Curvature, 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 curvature. It's a noun from 1603. One, the act of curving, the state of being curved. Two, a measure or amount of curving. Specifically, the rate of change of the angle through which the tangent to a curve turns in moving along the curve and which for a circle is equal to the reciprocal of the radius. Uh, That is the part where my brain says, what? So that number two was just a measure or amount of curving. And then we got into a whole specifically section with the tangents and the reciprocals and the radiuses. 3A, an abnormal curving as of the spine. What's the, Well, the, the spine naturally curves. There is a curvature to the spine and the neck, uh, but an abnormal curving would be also called curvature. I don't know why we have to, it's already got a curvature to it. I'm sure uh, doctors and chiropractors use this word in a very specific way. And 3B, a curved surface of an organ. Uh, Well, first I thought of an organ like the piano organ, but I don't think that's what they're talking about. What organ in your body would be called... What what curved surface of an organ in your body would be called curvature? Uh, You know, I think they're all curved in some way. A kidney? Oh, yes. A kidney is very curvaceous. It's got curves. It goes to the in and the out. Maybe livers, pancreas, spleen, gallbladder, stomach. I don't know. Do they have a curvature? Bloop, 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 bloop. Next word is curve. First form, adjective from the 15th century. This one is archaic, and it means bent or formed into a curve. It is from Latin curvus, which is akin to the Greek kirtos, which means convex. Also from Middle Irish kruin, which means round. Uh, so convex, it curves outwards. So this is bent or formed into a curve, and for whatever reason, uh, we're not using this word in that context really anymore. Uh, I forgot to mention, this is actually our last word, curve. Uh, we've got three forms. So, boop, 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 boop. Second form of curb, curve is a verb. Curve is a verb. From 
1594, starting with intransitive. Uh, no, no number for this part. To have or take a turn, change, or deviation from a straight line or plane surface without sharp breaks or angularity. If you are driving down the street and there's streets that are perpendicular to each other, if you turn left or right, this is a uh, this would be a sharp break. There's an ang you're turning at an angle. You know, it's a it's a sharp curve. So basically you're turning straight and then you turn left or right and it's a sharp curve. A uh, sharp turn. But a curve when you're turning, it's very it's more of a soft a soft I'm I'm moving my hand in a more gentle curve. You can't see it, but I'm explaining it to you. Just you know, you turn the wheel a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, and you're going to do a big curve. Um, a racetrack is going to have a curve. There's no hard angles. Um, so that's that's an example of a place where you would... Why am I explaining curve to you? You know curve, don't you? Now we have transitive. One, to cause to curve. Two, to throw a curveball to. And you would be throwing it to a batter. Three, to grade as an examination on a curve. And I think we will learn about that. Yes, we should be learning about that in the next form because that's a whole thing that maybe younger kids don't know about. Uh, but yes, grading on a curve, uh, you're curving the tests. Boo, 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 boo. Very last word, third form of curve Noun from 1666, and we've got a handful of definitions here. 1A, a line, especially when curved, as 1A1, the path of a moving point. Anything that moves um, organically, naturally, if you throw a ball, if you shoot a cannonball, whatever it is, if you throw something, if something is moving because of gravity, it will naturally uh, take a curved path. It can't go straight forward and then straight down. It's always going to be in a curve. 1A2, a line defined by an equation so that the coordinates of its points are functions of a single independent variable or parameter. 1B, the graph of a variable. Uh, I'm trying to go back to my younger days when I was learning about this type of math. Is this like a variable? Is this like x squared? The graph of that is curved because uh, won't get it, won't go into the details, but x squared, x cubed, something to a variable uh, will be curved. There's probably more to it than that. Apologies if I don't have it exactly right, but I'm in the right uh, realm. Number two. Something curved, as 2A, a curving line of the human body. The human body has many curves. Your feet are probably pretty curved. Your hands, your face, your hips, your knees, your butt. That's a curve. 2B, this is plural, so curves. Oh, uh, this um, synonym is parenthesis. So, the parentheses are also just called curves because they are curved. One is convex, one is concave. I wonder, I wonder if this is more of a British thing. Is it? Because I don't say that. 3A, this synonym is curveball. You see, if you say, I'm going to throw a curveball, you can also say, I'm going to throw a curve. 3B. The synonyms are trick and deception. Why is that? Well, you've, you've, uh, how do I say this? You've put somebody on a curve. You've curved them. You've curved, uh, what they're expecting. You have tricked them. You have sent it off into another direction. And so that's a curve, I guess. Number four. Okay, this, this is a, a longer one, and this is the one about the students. A distribution 
indicating the relative performance of individuals measured against each other that is used especially in assigning good, medium, or poor grades to usually predetermined proportions of students rather than in assigning grades based on predetermined standards of achievement. So that was a lot, uh, but if I remember correctly, basically what it means is there's a couple of ways to grade students. If you are not grading on a curve, then let's say you're giving them a test. Let's say 91 to 100 is an A. 81 to 90, maybe I should go the other way. 100 to 91 is an A. 90 to 81 is a B, etc. Or you can grade them on a curve, which means the person who has the highest grade, let's say they only got an 82, that would end up being an A, or around there would be an A. And then based on that, you've adjusted their scores, and then you can break it up into sections of what's an A, a B, a C, a D, etc. Um, and so typically, when you're grading on a curve, the people who would probably get a lower score end up getting a little bit of a higher score because the highest score uh, is now higher than it would be normally. But then there might be a person who's going to get 100 on the test, which means 100 is 100 is 100, and they've messed up the curve. Moving on to number five, the last one. This is uh, just a synonym, trend, T-R-E-N-D, the curve, the trend, how are things going, as in the example, a growth curve in advertising revenues. But now we have especially a prevalent trend or rate of progress. And this is often used in the phrases ahead of the curve and also behind the curve. As in the example, companies that are behind the curve in adopting new technologies. There's a trend happening and they are not on the trend, so they are behind the curve. Might not be so good for them in the long run financially. Curvy. That is an adjective. So the words that we had today in this episode, I shall read them to you now. Courtesy. Curtilage. Curtsy. Curtsy. Curule. Curvaceous. Curvature. Curve. Curve and curve. Let's see. That one. Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Not sure what to pick. Um, well, I think. I think mm, this is not uh, entirely true. Obviously, everything has its exceptions and whatever. But overall, as a society, as a culture, many people don't like to be curvaceous. And uh, I just, I just don't like that. I think that it, you got to be you, and uh, don't, don't compare yourself to other people. There are these quote unquote standards that are set by society and culture, and a lot of people don't like those. And uh, th- there's, you know, I'm, I'm very much thinking of uh, females because that's typically where this happens you know it's much more common for women to look at oh the models the six foot very skinny models and that's just unattainable unattainable and it's ridiculous and it's largely about genetics too so don't be worrying about that if you're curvaceous own it just own it do it be that love it love yourself Be curvaceous, curvaceous. All right, that is all I have to say for today. Uh, Yeah, hopefully hopefully I can get a couple of these uh, guest episodes recorded sooner than later. One of them I have scheduled actually for uh, five or so days from now. Um, Yeah, yeah, all right, I think that's fine. Thank you very much for listening to this. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another riveting episode of The Dictionary. 
uh, check out the show notes. There's a lot of stuff in there for you to do and check out and think about and, uh, you know, do. Uh, Twitter and Instagram, at DictionaryPod. Personal is at Spejampar, S-P-E-J-A-M-P-A-R. Email is DictionaryPod at gmail.com. Uh, find this on YouTube. Go join the Patreon. If you want to give me a few bucks a month, you can get episodes early. There's a Google Voice number where you can call it and you can leave a message. You can say something about something that happened or something that's coming up. Maybe you want to talk about a word in the letter D section and you really, really love it. You want to tell me what you think? Maybe I'll put it in an episode if I get it early enough. Um... There are some other things that I can't think of at the moment other than merchandising. So uh, just quickly have to say that at the time that I am recording this, it is the day after, it's May 3rd, 2022. It is the day after the uh, leaked document from the Supreme Court came out about Roe v. Wade and... I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but other than the fact to say I really, 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 really hope that Roe v. Wade does not get overturned, um, and it's it's just so frustrating because the people who are making these decisions are making these decisions based on ridiculous ideas. That's my opinion. Uh, I think the majority of people agree with me. Um, yeah, it's a problem. This is, this is bad. Real bad. Um, and we knew that this might happen. Six, five and a half years ago, this was definitely a thing that might be happening. So, hey, go out and vote and do something, please. All right, on that note, let's talk about this last section of page 307 in this very large dictionary book. The first word is curveball, noun from 1936. A slow or moderately fast cur- uh, no, moderately fast baseball pitch thrown with spin to make it swerve downward and usually to the left when thrown from the right hand or to the right when thrown from the left hand. I don't know how or why this happens, but it is, it's physics. Based on the way that the stitching on the baseball is, and based on the way that the person throws it, uh, the the stitching has to be in their hand in a certain way, and then they have to curve their hand in a certain way. Uh, It's fascinating that this will happen, but this is science. It's it's real life. Um, Yeah, it's just very cool. How much it will curve, I'm not sure. Maybe I will find a a YouTube clip or something that you can can watch it happen in real time. Curveball is also a verb. Next is curve fitting. Two words, noun from 1902. The empirical determination of a curve or function that approximates a set of data or data. Curve fitting. It's very mathy. I don't quite understand it. I feel like I've done that before. It sounds way too much like a talking to a baby. All right. Uh, next is the first form of curvet. C U R V E T. Noun from 1575. A prancing leap of a horse, in which the hind legs are raised just before the forelegs touch the ground. Prancing leap of a horse. The hind legs are raised just before the forelegs, so they they leap with the forelegs, and right before the legs, the front legs hit the ground, the back legs leap up as well. Did I get that right? Maybe I did. A curve it. Uh, Corvette, sorry. Uh, This is Italian, or it is from the Italian Corvetta, which is is from the Middle French Corbet, from Corbert, which means to curve. 
Also from the Latin cur- curare, which I assume also is curving. So it's it's all about the, the body of the horse gets very curved because it goes up and down and then up again. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a curvette. Ha-boo-boo-boo-boo. Next word is the second form of curvette intransitive verb from 1592 to make a curvette and then also the synonyms prance and caper can a human make a curvette how would a human do one would i mean you could get on all fours and go up with your arms and then go up with your legs but that's probably really hard to do but or you could just prance prancing is fine too have a boo Next is curvilinear. Curvilinear. It's funny because we have curve and line in there. Curvilinear. Adjective from 1696. One, consisting of or bounded by curved lines. And then also represented by a curved line. What would this be? Number two, marked by a flowing tracery. I have no idea what a tracery is, but we have an example. Curvilinear Gothic. So I think this is talking about architecture, probably. Curvilinearity is a noun and a great, great word. Curvilinearity. Yeah, it's just from the Latin curvus and linea. So it's curve and line. Next is cushet. Cushet? Cushet. I think that's how you would say it. C-U-S-H-A-T. Noun from before the 12th century. And this is chiefly Scottish. That's why I don't know how to say it. The synonym is wood pigeon. Wood pigeon? It's a pigeon made out of wood? Or is it a pigeon that lives in the tree? What is a wood pigeon? I don't know, but I do know that it is a cushet. Next is cushaw. C-U-S-H-A-W. Cushaw. Noun from 1698. A squash of any of several cultivars of winter squash. The species names are Curcurbita argirosperma and then also Curcurbita mixta and Curcurbita moscata. Moschata. The origin of this is unknown. Kusha. Kusha. Squash? Squash? Kusquash. No, no, didn't work. Next we have Cushing's disease. Two words. Cushing's is with a capital C and apostrophe S. Noun from circa 1935. Cushing's syndrome, especially when caused by excessive production of ACTH by the pituitary gland. So uh, if your pituitary gland is is like, hey, I got to make a lot of ACTH, then uh, you might get Cushing's syndrome, which could lead to Cushing's disease. And this is from Harvey Cushing. So, uh, well, I would guess that it doesn't say that he's a doctor or anything. So I have to assume that he is the one who, uh, the first one who had this that, They named it. They named it after him. He had it, but maybe people had it before. But yeah. So next we have Cushing's Syndrome, if you were confused about that. Let's get a little bit more information. Noun from 1937. An abnormal bodily condition that is caused by excess corticosteroids and especially cortisol, usually from adrenal or pituitary hyperfunction and is characterized especially by obesity, hypertension, muscular weakness, 
and easy bruising. So your pituitary gland, your adrenal glands, they might be functioning too much, hyper-functioning, they're overactive, and then so you could get uh, lots of cortisol, lots of corticosteroids in your body, not good, and then, yeah, obese, hypertension, muscular weakness, and easy bruising. Those are all symptoms, and then it could uh, could lead to Cushing's disease. How do you do it? How do you take care of this? You probably got to take some drugs to chill out the adrenal glands and pituitary glands. Next is cushion. First form, noun from the 14th century. One. There's a lot of definitions for cushion. One. A soft pillow or pad, usually for sitting, reclining, or kneeling. Two. A bodily part resembling a pad. (laughs) This must be... More than likely, this is probably your butt. Your butt is a cushion because it's like a pad. Number three, something resembling a cushion as 3A, the number two definition for the word pillow. 3B, it is the number three definition for the word rat. Hmm, rat. 3C, a pad of springy rubber along the inside of the rim of a billiard table. It's, uh, I didn't realize there was springy rubber in there, but yeah, the edge, the wall of the billiard table, it sort of uh, angles out a little bit, and uh, yeah, I guess it's uh, it's just a springy rubber in there. So it's it's easier to, to bounce the balls off of it, make those bank shots. 3D, a padded insert in a shoe. So you get you get some you get some padding in there, so it's more cushiony, uh, and it's it's easier on your joints if you can walk on some cushiony stuff. 3E, an elastic body for reducing shock. What sort of elastic body are we talking about? Reducing shock. Yes. That's kind of like the shoe thing. You're re- reducing the shock in the body, but I still don't know what this elastic body is. 3F, a mat laid under a large rug to ease the effect of wear. Uh, there's a rug next to me. I don't know if we have a cushion under it. We probably should, but we might not. Um, it, in addition to uh, easing the effects of wear, it might also uh, stop the rug from sliding around, create some friction. For A, something as an economic factor or a medical procedure serving to mitigate the effects of disturbances or disorders. Cushion, something, um, hmm, disturbances or disorders. I'm trying to think. Something as an economic factor or medical procedure. Hmm, interesting. What sort of disturbances or disorders are these? Cushion? I guess if you... I don't know. Moving on. 4B. A reserve supply uh, as, as of money. A reserve supply as of money. So your savings account. That would be a reserve supply of money. So you have a little cushion. If you lose your job or have an unexpected expense, uh, then you need a bit of a cushion so you can cover it. Not a lot of people have this. Most people don't. This is why our economic system is all screwed up, because some people think that's fine. It is not fine. Some people can't afford anything. They just are constantly living in debt. I don't even know a whole lot about this, but I know that it's true. And we need more people to realize this. Uh, We got to fix it. 4C, a comfortable lead, as in a 4-0 cushion in the ninth inning. Again, it's just a thing. You make it feel a little bit better. You, you You can spare to lose a little bit, and you're still okay. It's a cushion. Cushionless, 
is an adjective. Cushiony is also an adjective. Uh, this is from the Latin coxa. I didn't go through all of the different languages, but it leads down to Latin coxa, which means hip. Uh, hip is your, maybe your hips, your butt is by your hips, and that's where you got some cushion on your body, so maybe that's how it is related to that. Second form of cushion is a verb from circa 1738. Uh, let's see, I think it is only transitive. One, to seat or place on a cushion. Oh, can you please uh, cushion that cat? The cat will very much love it to be cushioned on that cushion. Two, to suppress by ignoring. Three, to furnish with a cushion, as in a cushioned seat. I need a cushioned seat. I don't really like sitting on hard things. I don't know who does. Four, a, to mitigate the effects of, as in trying to cushion the blow. That could be, I guess, a physical hit, but more than likely it's, uh, if you learn something bad, uh, maybe you can cushion the blow, or, yeah, yeah. 4B, to protect against force or shock, as in, cushion the ride. I once was on a roller coaster, and it was not cushioned. There were some turns that were very jarring, and you very easily, your head would smack around a lot. I think I hit my head a couple of times just from doing these really tight turns, and uh, I was there at maybe eighth grade uh, on like a school trip. And one of the uh, one of my peers, one of the other people there was on that ride. And I think his ear actually started bleeding because of this ride. It was so jarring. It needed some cushion. Number five, to check gradually so as to minimize shock of moving parts. Boo, 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 boo. Next is Cushitic. Cushitic. Capital C U S H I T I C. Noun from circa 1903. A subfamily of the Afro Asiatic language family comprising various languages spoken in Eastern Africa and especially in Ethiopia, Djibouti, Somalia, and Kenya. And Cushitic is also an adjective. So this is from Kush with a C, and then in parentheses, or I can also say in curves, it's Kush with a K. Uh, and that is, a, I would assume, a region in Africa. It just says Kush Africa. Uh, so is it a region? I don't think it's a country. It must be this whole eastern region of Africa. Ethiopia, Djibouti, Somalia, and Kenya. And they speak uh, the Cushitic Afro-Asiatic languages. Boo, 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 boo. We have one more word for this episode. It is cushy. C-U-S-H-Y. Adjective from 1915. Entailing little hardship or difficulty. As in, a cushy job with a high salary. That is what most people are going for. They want to do the least amount of work, the easiest job, and make the most money. Most people want that. And uh, yeah, I understand it. I get it. I also think that there's a lot of um, satisfaction in a job where you're not making as much money, but you are maybe working harder, but you are doing something very important, and you can you can see that you are making a difference in some way, and I think that's pretty great, too. Cushily is an adverb. This is from uh, not a lot of information, but it is from the Hindi Kush, spelled K-H-U-S, also the Urdu Kush, which is K-H-U-S-H, also from the Persian Kush, 
which is K-H-U-S-H. Uh, I want to know how they use this word in their languages. Kush, kush. Uh, it probably still means entailing little hardship or difficulty because it doesn't say what their words mean in English. All right. So today we had curveball, curve fitting, curvet. Oh, it's been so long since I read these words. What are they? Okay, curvet, curvet, curvilinear, uh, cushet. I think I said it right. Cushaw, Cushing's disease. Cushing's syndrome, cushion, cushion, cushitic, and cushy. Cushy, cushy, cushy. All right, what are we going to pick? Um, let's see. There's that and there's that. Uh, well, I mean, maybe the most fun would be curvet, a prancing leap of a horse. I don't know. How do you sing a song about curvet? Curvet, curvet, the horse is curvetting. Yeah, that's fine. Um, let's see, what am I watching? We've been watching the fourth season of Mrs. Maisel. We watched a movie that I've heard is good called With Nail and I. And, uh, I don't know, maybe I need to see it again. It was, it was weird. I don't know. I didn't love it. Uh, if you have feelings about that movie, let me know. Um, yeah, wasn't I didn't know I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know anything about it. But uh, yeah, didn't uh, didn't uh, didn't hit me. Didn't strike me in that way. I don't know. It was just a little odd for me. Okay, I think that's fine for this episode. I appreciate you listening. Uh, come talk to me. Tag me in a thing if you wanted to post a thing. Oh, yeah, that's good. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. This is the first section on page 308. And uh, just because of the way that the words fall on this page, um, I'm splitting this page up into three episodes instead of the normal four episodes. So each of them are going to be a bit longer than normal, uh, but I, maybe I'll just try and uh, get through it a bit more quickly um, so it's not crazy long. All right, let's get into it. The first word is cusk, C-U-S-K, noun from 1616, one, a large edible North Atlantic fish of the cod family, and this scientific name is... It's the same word twice. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's either brosmi brosmi or brosm brosm. B R O S M E. Not sure how to say it. And number two is the synonym burbot. Burbot or burbit. Uh, this is probably an alternative of tusk, T U S K, which is a kind of codfish. So, it's a cusk, which is a tusk, which is a codfish. Uh, let's see. I will go... No, that's... I'm do, I've been doing the same sound effect. Let's do something different. Okay, let's do... That's just a good standard swoosh, swooshy, swishy kind of sound. Next is cusp. C-U-S-P. Noun from 1585. So there's no numbers, but we have some letters. The definition is just the synonyms point and apex. Apex would be like the top, the, the pinnacle, the point, as a. A point of transition, as from one historical period to the next. And then the synonyms for this one are turning point, edge, and verge, as, as in the example, on the cusp of stardom. Almost there, not quite, hasn't quite reached the stardom area, but just on the cusp of it. Turning point, edge, verge, uh, and then uh, maybe they're going to get into it here, but uh, the, um, the, the zodiac signs, they all have a cusp. It's like maybe a week, 
that's like a few days on either edge, either end, either side of the uh, the date. So it's like, I don't know, September 22nd. And then a few days on either side of that is the cusp of that. Uh, it's turning into the next one. B, either horn of a crescent moon. Either horn of a crescent moon. So I guess the, where it comes to a point and both of those, those would be the called the horns, so either of those are the cusp. That's where it transitions from the light part to the rest of it, the dark part. Uh, or the light part just transitions to nothing. C, a fixed point on a mathematical curve at which a point tracing the curve would exactly reverse its direction of motion. Curve at which a point tracing the curve would exactly reverse yeah so what's it's like uh when like when you're breathing in i feel like i mentioned this before you're breathing in where does it end the very end of the breath in right before it turns into a breath out is the cusp that's sort of similar idea to this mathematical curve but in this case it's an actual physical thing a curve it curves and then when does it go to curving back in the other direction that's the cusp d an ornamental pointed projection formed by or arising from the intersection of two arcs or foils. I think that's similar to C. I don't know. E1. A point on the grinding surface of a tooth. And then E2. A fold or flap of a cardiac valve. So what's this tooth one? A point on the so the top of your tooth where it grinds against the other teeth, uh, one of those points that sticks up, I guess, is called the cusp. Oh, and then what are the teeth? The cusp. The, there's the um, oh, I can't think of my teeth names. Um, Fred, Joe, Samantha, and then um, E two is the fold or flap of a cardiac valve. So the valves in your heart where the blood is flowing through. I think there's maybe three three flaps that. Uh, so each one of those, I guess, is called a cusp. Cuspate is an adjective, and cusped with an ed, that is also an adjective. This is from the Latin word cuspis, which means point. Next is cuspid, noun from 1841, and the synonym is the number one definition for the word canine. The dog. Uh, well, no, this is probably the teeth. I think the cuspids, yes. That's what I was thinking. We had E1 for cusp. It's the tooth thing. And then the cuspid, it must be a tooth. We'd have to go very far back in the seas to, to go back just to confirm. Ooh, here it is. Uh, it is uh, the, the canonical pointed tooth. Yep, it's the tooth, the cuspids. Next is cuspidate. Adjective from 1692, having a cusp. That must be the point on the grinding part of the tooth. And then also terminating in a point. And yeah, we learned that it's from the Latin cuspis, which is point. And so that's why the, that pointed tooth, the canine tooth, is also called the cuspid because it typically comes more to a point than the other teeth do. It's the one to, to dig into something, to to point, to to stab it. That's what I was looking for. As in, a couple examples, a cuspidate leaf. It comes to a point. Also as in, cuspidate molars. They have a cusp because they have the little pointy pieces that grind against the other ones. Um, more specifically for the etymology, it is from the Latin verb cuspidare, which means to make pointed, and then again, cuspis, which means point. Next is cuspidation, noun from 1848, and it means decoration with cusps. What sort of cusps are we decorating with? Teeth? Cardiac valves? Uh, what, are, what are some of these other ones? Not probably those. But uh, I guess if you desk decorate with cusps, I would have thought that the definition would say um, to make pointed. If you're making something pointed, you are 
cuspidating it. But no, decoration with cusps. Next is cuspidor. It ends in a D-O-R, cuspidor. Noun from 1735. The synonym is just the word spittoon. That's where you spit your stuff. So, this is from the Portuguese cospiduro, which is a place for spitting. <laughs> I need one of these. Uh, let's see. That is from the verb cuspir, which means to spit. From the Latin conspuere, which is from spuere, which means to spit. And there is more at the word spew. If you're going to spew, spew into this. Is that what he said? I think so. Spittoon is a cuspidor. Pshew. Next is the first form of the word cuss. C-U-S-S. Noun from 1771. 1A is the number one definition for the word curse, which is just on the previous page, which was a prayer or invocation for harm or injury to come upon one. You're cursing someone. Um, And then 1B is the number two definition for the word curse, which is something that is cursed or accursed. And number two for cuss is the 4C definition for the word fellow. Yeah, I'm not going to look ahead. I can't do that. I will break my rule. So when we get there, we'll understand it all. Hmm. Trying to think of what that would be. Do fellows cuss? Yes, some fellows cuss. But also some some ladies cuss too. So I don't think that's what it is. Next is the second form of cuss. This is a, tr- uh, it's a verb from 1768, starting with transitive, which is just the synonym curse. And this is often used with the word out, as in got cussed out by his boss. His boss cussed him out, cursed him out. Does that mean he swore at him a lot? He said many curse words or cuss words at him or her? Yes, by his boss. Um, Maybe. I mean, if he really screwed up, maybe his boss cussed him out. Intransitive is also the synonym curse. Just used in different contexts, obviously. Cusser is a noun. Uh, Okay. Next is cussed with an ED. Adjective from 1834. Number one is the synonym cursed. You can see that these words are very connected. Um, Trying to remember. Let's see. Let's go look at curse. Um, It's from curse. So I think cuss... I think it came from, yes, uh, the, uh, it, it is from curse. So it was curse first, and then somehow people shortened it or changed it to cuss. Maybe it was a, uh, a regional thing, a dialect. I'm not sure, but that's what that is. So number two for cussed, synonyms are obstinate and cantankerous. Cussedly is an adverb, and cussedness is a noun. Maybe if you are obstinate or cantankerous, you are saying a lot of cuss words. That is our next word. Cuss word is one word, noun from 1872. Number one, the synonym is swear word. Swear, cuss, curse, these are all interchangeable. Depends on probably, yeah, what part of the country you're in. Which, which do you use? What do you use? Hmm. I think I've always used swear word. Cuss? Not, that was not really a word that I used. I mean, I'm not talking about the actual words. I'm just saying, how do you describe this world of words which are not family-friendly, which we already have gotten to and will continue to get through uh, through the end of this book? Um, and that is why I will probably just make this podcast not family friendly so we can just let out all the cuss words we want because they're just words and I think we all just need to get over that. Some of us already have. Number two, a term of abuse. Also, 
a derogatory term. How is it derogatory? All right, no more cussing. Next is custard. Mm -hmm. Noun from circa 1706, a pudding-like usually sweetened mixture made with eggs and milk. And I'm pretty sure there are other ingredients than eggs and milk. Because how are you going to make it like pudding and sweet? And you got to throw in other flavors, probably. Custardy is an adjective. That would be something that is like custard. Maybe like a custard, a custard-like consistency, which is already pudding-like. Um, this is a Middle English word, and it means a kind of pie. A kind of pie? Well, I guess custard pie, yeah. There you go. But then you could also just have custard on its own. It doesn't need to be in a crust. Oh, um, oddly enough, it is also uh, an alternative of crustard or crustade, which is probably from the Anglo-French crust, which means crust. So pie, crust, it's all related, man. Also from the Latin crusta, which means crust. But it's funny because custard is pudding-like. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with a crust. There's no hard, crunchy thing on it. It's just the pudding stuff in the middle. But then, but yeah, it's funny. Funny how words work. Next is custard apple. Two words, noun from 1657. 1A. Any of several chiefly tropical American soft-fleshed edible fruits. Oh, there's no scientific name for that one. But why are they called custard apple? Do they taste very sweet? Maybe the rest of the definitions will help. 1B. Any of a genus of trees or shrubs bearing this fruit, especially a small West Indian tree. So the genus name is... Anona, A-N-N-O-N-A, that is from the family uh, Anonasii, and that is the custard apple family. And then the West Indian tree is, I think it is Anona reticulata. Number two for custard apple is the number two definition for the word pawpaw and... I am confused. I mean, when I hear Papa, I think of somebody that's like their their what they call their grandpa, but uh, maybe it's something else. I don't know. We will find out later. I gotta have a custard apple apple. I don't think I've ever had one. Phew. Next is custodial. Adjective from 1772. 1A. Relating to guardianship custodial and uh bless you and uh wasn't this uh what uh Britney Spears was going through the cust- custodian cust- not a not a custodian I don't remember the the name of it but yeah it was some sort of guardianship kind of thing 1b relating to providing or being protective care or services for basic needs Bless you again. As in, nursing and custodial care. Two, having sole or primary custody of a child. As in, the custodial parent. Just the one dealing with all the stuff. They have custody. That is why it is custodial. Next is custodian. It's it's a word that I have heard my whole life, but for some reason now, it just sounds very strange. Custodian. Noun from 1602. One that guards and protects or maintains, especially one entrusted with guarding and keeping property or records or with custody or guardianship of prisoners or inmates. Custodianship is a noun. Uh, So they guard and protect or maintain. 
And typically, I think when most people hear custodian, they think of janitor, which I'm a little surprised they didn't specifically mention that here. But um, but yes, they guard and protect or maintain a school, say, you know, clean the stuff, take care of the stuff, uh, very important job, and they don't get enough respect. Next is custody. The custodian has custody of certain things, like prisoners or inmates, or bathrooms and hallways. Okay, so custody, noun from the 15th century. Immediate charge and control exercised by a person or an authority. They have charge and control. And um, the example of what they have control over is a ward or a suspect. And then also the synonym safekeeping. They have to keep them safe, safe, yes, keep them safe. They have custody. This is from Latin custodia, which means guarding. Yep, you got custody of a person. You are their guardian. You are guarding them. Next is the first form of the word custom. Noun from the 13th century, 1a. A usage or practice common to many or to a particular place or class, or habitual with an individual. 1b. Long-established practice, practice, there's no d there, long-established practice considered as unwritten law. What are the customs that are unwritten? It's just the community has these things that they do, but nothing's written down. 1c. Repeated practice. It is my custom to read this podcast to you, to read this dictionary in podcast form to you. I'm very very practiced in it, and it is repeated. 1D, the whole body of usages, practices, or conventions that regulate social life. All of the stuff that pertains to social life is the custom. All different parts of the world, big parts, little parts, They all have their own little customs, different towns, different regions. It's a lot. And when you go to another one of these places, you have to respect the customs and find out what what they do. Do some research ahead of time. Number two is plural. So 2A is duties, tolls, or imposts imposed by the sovereign law of a country on imports or exports. And they're called Customs. You got to go through customs when you land in another place. Duties, tolls, not that, those duties, the other duties. The duties, probably like a thing you got to do or pay. 2B is, I guess, technically also plural, but it says usually singular. So it is the agency, establishment, or procedure for collecting such customs. 3A. Business patronage is custom. 2B, usually habitual patrons, and the synonym is customers. Oh, interesting. Customers. They are the custom. The patronage is the custom. I never... It still doesn't really make sense to me, but I'm understanding it a little bit better. Patrons who go to a business are customers. A synonym for all is the word habit. Um, okay, this is from the Latin verb consuiscere, which means to accustom, which is from sesquere, which also means to accustom, uh, akin to the word suus, which is S-U-U-S, which means one's own. And then there's more at the word suicide. One's own, that is your, your eh, yeah, suicide. You are taking the life of yourself, your own. But then if we go, then it, we expand it out to suiscere, your custom. I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure how that's connected to your own, but, you know, it's fine. Pew. 
Next is the second form of custom adjective from 1830. One, made or performed according to personal order. You can get lots of things made custom. It could be food. It could be clothes. It could be a motorcycle. It could be golf clubs. You get them made custom for you. Your size, your style, whatever you want. Two, specializing in custom work or operation, as in a custom tailor. They're going to tailor the suit to fit yourself, your body, but then you have to make sure that you don't change your body. Don't gain weight, don't lose weight, otherwise it's not going to fit. Next is customary. Adjective from 1535, one, based on or established by custom. Two, commonly practiced, used, or observed. And the synonym is the word usual. Customarily is an adverb. Customariness is a noun. Next is custom built. Two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1925. Built to individual specifications, as in a custom house. You can get your house made the way that you want it. The size, the shape, all the stuff, how it's all laid out. Do you want siding? Do you want brick? What kind of roof do you want? All the things you get to decide within reason Make sure that the architect, the engineer, the contractor can physically build it and it will stand up. But pretty much, you can say, make me this house custom built. One more for this episode. It is the word customer. C-U-S-T-O-M-E-R. Noun from the 15th century. One. One that purchases a commodity or service. You're buying something, you're a customer. Two, an individual usually having some specified distinctive trait, as in a real tough customer. What what sort of, what is the specified distinctive trait? I guess they're still a customer. I don't understand why we needed this number two definition in the first place. Even though they're a tough customer, they're still purchasing a commodity or service. That one's a little bit odd to me. All right. So the words in this episode were cusk, cusp, cuspid, cuspidate, cuspidation, cuspidor, cus, cus, cust, cusword, custard, custard apple, custodial, custodian, custody, custom, custom, customary, custom built, customer. It's uh, harder for this one because I have more words to pick from. But I think I may know what I'm going to pick. There are obviously some very important, interesting words here. But I think I just got to go with cuss word as the word of the episode because they're great words. You can use them to enhance what you want to say. And they're just fun and silly. And we all take them too seriously. So don't take anything too seriously. Just in general. Cuss word. What's your favorite cuss word? There are some really good cuss words in the world. Let's learn from cu- No. Let's learn some cuss words in other languages. Yeah. That is going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye.